Hey, hey, what's up, my friends? So welcome to the Ultimate Forex Trading Course for Beginners. So this is a comprehensive trading course that will teach you everything from A to Z, right, to becoming a proficient Forex trader. So the course is structured in a step-by-step -step manner. So this is really for you if you have no Forex trading experience or very little Forex trading experience. So the course is structured in such a way where the earlier lessons, right, builds on the last. So you can't just, you know, maybe, let's say, skip to the last section because it might not make sense to you, especially if you have no Forex trading experience. So my suggestion is to go through this program step by step as the techniques, the strategies, the concepts, right, builds on the foundation that you have learned earlier. At the same time, right, some of you watching this might be an experienced trader. If that's the case, right, I will put the timestamps in the description. You can see, you know, which part of this training video might interest you, which topic, right, and just go to the relevant uh, section of this video. So without further ado, let's get started. So in this section, you will learn, number one, what is Forex trading? Who are the biggest players in Forex trading? The advantages of Forex trading over the other markets like stocks and what are the Forex market hours? So let's get started. So first and foremost, what is Forex trading? Well, Forex stands for foreign exchange in case you haven't you know, realized it yet. It is simply an exchange of one currency for another. And you might be thinking, why do I want to you know, exchange currencies, Rainer? Very simple. Let's say, for example, you want to go on a vacation. And let's say you're in the US and you want to come to Singapore for a holiday. Well, guess what? If you bring your US dollars into Singapore and buy a bowl of noodles, the lady will give you the, you know, like what you're trying to do, man. So clearly, right, you can't use US dollars in Singapore. So what you need to do is to go to a money changer, maybe in the US. And what you'll do is sell your US dollars in exchange for Singapore dollars. And then you can, you know, come to Singapore, have a nice holiday, have a bowl of noodles, rice, and, you know, have fun. So that's pretty much, you know, one example of uh, Forex trading or Rather, you know, the exchange of currency and what the purpose is for. On the other hand, for corporations, let's say a company like Toyota who produces car, let's say they need to buy some uh, rubber for their tires, for example, okay? And, you know, uh, you know, they in Japan, right, maybe they are not a producer of rubber and they need to go to India to buy some rubber for their cars. So what do Toyota, Toyota Corporation do? What they'll do is they will sell their yen in exchange for Indian rupee. So they can use that Indian rupee go to India and buy some rubber for their tires. Make sense? So that's another example of Forex trading. One is from a retail perspective and one is from a corporation perspective. And this is a $6.6 .6 trillion market. The Forex market is a $6.6 .6 trillion market. Look at the number of zeros, my man. It has more, the number of zeros is even more than the, the, the hair I have on my head. So that's a huge, huge market. So who are the players of Forex trading? So. Uh, let me just, you know, give you a very simple chart, right, to kind of, you know, break down who trades the Forex market. So you can see over here, primarily the Forex markets are traded by, you know, the major banks. This could be due to, you know, hedging their portfolios, filling their, you know, uh, meeting their requirements of their clients, like commercial companies, which I'll explain shortly. Uh, this could, uh, a Forex market is also, you know, traded by hedge funds for, you know, speculative purposes, maybe to hedge their portfolios. And done by commercial companies, for example, like Toyota, as I've mentioned earlier. So, for example, how does commercial companies and bank work hand in hand? So, very simple. So, let's say, you know, a company like, again, Toyota, they know they need, let's say they, they want to buy rubber from India. They can't use yen in India because, you know, the, the Indians might think, you know, what is this piece of paper, right? Am I supposed to make a paper plane out of this? No. So, what Toyota will do is they might go to a bank and say, hey, I need to exchange, you know, X number of yens, right, in exchange for Indian rupee. So, the commercial bank will go to I mean, a commercial company will go to the bank, right, and you'll settle this uh, this uh, transaction. So this is how they kind of you know, work interrelated together. And of course, banks can, you know, trade within uh, among one another to hedge their portfolio and stuff like that. And finally, at the bottom of the food chain, you have the retail traders like us who, you know, go into this for maybe uh, speculative purposes, could be, you know, going for vacation, you need to change a bit of uh, currencies. So yeah, this is uh, largely, you know, what, what are the players in the Forex markets do. So... Advantages of Forex trading. So what are the advantages? Number one, right? It is low barrier to entry. So you can start with, you know, as little as $100. So unlike, you know, futures or stocks where you probably would have to start with a larger amount for Forex trading, right? To open an account, $100, right? Is, I would say enough, right? To open an account. It has high liquidity. So you can enter and exit your trades easily. So if you trade Forex and you want to buy, let's say, a currency pair like Euro dollar, you can pretty much get at the price, right, that you see on your screen. Unlike, you know, certain markets, like let's say penny stock, sometimes 
uh, market is moving quickly or market is illiquid when you thought you buy at hundred dollars and end up you buy the stock at hundred and five dollars due to you know uh, slippages and stuff like that so in forex trading you still have slippages but i would say it's lesser compared to the stock markets then uh, the market is open 24 5 for forex right you can trade pretty much anytime you want unlike the stock markets which is you know just open for a fixed number of hours in a day so what are the forex market hours so as mentioned right forex is open 24 hours five days a week so it's open from Sunday to Friday, right? Depending on where you are in the world. If you're like me in Singapore, it's open from Monday to Friday. If, I mean, Monday to Saturday. If you're in US, then you'll be from Sunday to Friday because of the uh, hours in the Forex market, because of your time zone. So what are the Forex market hours? Okay, so let me just break this down so you can understand this chart. So first one over here is the daylight saving time. So this refers to the summer months in US, okay? In the uh, overseas, in other countries. In Singapore, we don't have daylight saving time. So this is a bit... Uh, uh, new to you if you are in Asia and the time that we use to depict the hours we use GMT over here okay so for example let's say uh, London market right for summer period the London session right starts at 7 a.m. GMT and ends at 4 p.m. GMT so 1600 right, is in essence at right, 4 p.m. if you convert it okay for New York it starts at 12 p.m. GMT the New York session and it ends at 9 p.m. GMT, New York session. So you can see how this uh this uh table right breaks down the different forex sessions and their open and closing hours. So this is for daylight savings time during the summer period. And for standard time, right, during the winter period, right, the hours right are slightly different. They are different by an hour. So if you look now at London again, now we open at 8 a.m. Whereas previously it opened at 7 a.m. Okay, so previously 7 a.m. here. So during winter months, right, it starts at 8 a.m. and ends at 5 p.m. For New York, it starts at 1 p.m. and closes at or ends at 10 p.m. So you can see uh, this table here. Uh, I would say it's useful, right, to, to know, you know, what time a certain Forex market session opens or closes in your particular time zone. And some of you might be wondering, hey, Raina, how do I know whether is it a winter or summer period? Simple. Just Google. <laughs> if you Google, right, then you know whether, hey, is it now standard time or is it daylight savings time? So I, I'm not going to put that down here because it really depends on the time of the year. So let's do a quick recap. Number one, Forex trading is simply an exchange of one currency for another. It's traded by banks, corporations, brokers, and retail traders like you and me. Forex trading has a low barrier to entry, high liquidity, and the market is open 24-5. And finally, the Forex market hours are broken down into four different sessions. The Sydney session, the Tokyo, London, and New York. And one thing to add, right, a bonus thing is that uh, the most volatile session, right, in the Forex market is during the London and New York overlap. So it's actually during these few hours from here to here because both the London and the New York session are open and these are kind of like the biggest financial markets in the world. So a lot of transactions are going on during this Forex market hours. And if you look at the Forex charts, like the 15 minutes or the one hour time frame, you can see that during this period, right, the candles right, are moving a lot, a lot more during this uh, few hours of the day. So this is just one additional thing to share with you. Okay, so we have done the recap. So uh, that's pretty much it. Now, moving on, right, you will learn what is a currency pair, what is a base and code currency, what are the different types of currency pairs? So let's get started. Number one, what is a currency pair? So one thing to note is that you trade currency in pairs, not as a standalone. So just like, you know, when you go to a supermarket to buy an orange, you don't say, hey, I want to buy some orange. They will tell you, yeah, you want to buy some orange, right? But you have to, you know, exchange, right, your money for an orange. So same thing for currency pairs, right? When you want to trade currencies, you have to exchange one currency for another currency. You can't just say, I want to buy some euros. It's then the other person on the or the other par party will be thinking, sure, you want to buy some euros, so what are you giving me in exchange? So this is why currency pairs, or rather why currencies right, trade in pairs, not as a standalone. So in essence, right, a currency pairs help you measure a currency's value against another currency. So for example, let me explain, right, euro against the dollar. So when you, let's say, buy the euro dollar, in essence, what you're doing is you're buying the euro currency, all right, and you're selling the US dollar. So in essence, right, when you are buying the euro, you're giving the other party US dollars in exchange for the euro currency. So just like you're buying an apple from the supermarket, you're giving your money in exchange for that apple. So it works in pair. Likewise, for dollar against the yen, you are buying the US dollar, and in return, right, you give the other party Japanese yen. Make sense? Moving on. What is a base currency, or what is a base currency? 
currency. So let me explain. A base currency is, in essence, right, the first currency that appears in a currency pair. So this will illustrate. So for example, euro against the dollar, the first currency of the pair is called a base currency. And I'll, I'll explain why shortly. So what is a code currency? So the code currency is the second currency that appears in a currency pair. And for the euro dollar example, the US dollar is the code currency. And now you might be wondering, hey, Rainer, what's the purpose, purpose of all this, man? So let me explain. The purpose of all this is to tell you how much it costs in one in code currency to buy one base currency. I know that sounds like a technical mouthful, so I'll break it down very simply, which I've, I've actually done earlier. So for example, euro dollar at 1.3500. What it means is, you know that euro is the base currency, right? Let's call it B, base. And the dollar, as mentioned, is the quote currency. Let's put it Q. So this tells you how much it costs in quote currency to buy one base currency. So in essence, what this tells you is that for one euro dollar, it will cost you one dollar and 35 cents USD. So let's say you go to a money changer. Hey, I want to buy one euro, man. And the guy say, sure, my man, give me $1.35 USD and I'll give you one euro. That's how it works, right? And that's how you kind of interpret this, right? <laughs> okay, it tells you how much it costs in quote currency to buy one base currency. And I think that should be uh, pretty self-explanatory. If you don't understand this, just rewind this video and I'm pretty sure you'll get it. So when you're trading currencies, right, there are different types of currency pairs and I'll explain you know, what are the three different types of currency pairs that you'll encounter. Number one is what we call the major currency pairs. Number two, we have cross currency pairs. And number three, exotic currency pairs. Ooh la la. So let me explain. Major currency pairs, these are in essence, right, or rather they refer to the most traded currency pairs in the world. So these are the seven most traded currency pairs in the world. They're all uh, dollar denominated, like you know, the euro against the dollar, the pound against the dollar, dollar against the Canadian, etc. So if you are new to Forex trading, right, now these are, the, I would say, the seven currency pairs that you might want to consider starting to, I mean, to trade first because they are usually, uh, I would say their transaction costs are lower due to lower spreads. And, you know, you get less slippages when trading this uh, most, the seven most popular currency pairs. So these are the major currency pairs. The next one, cross-currency pairs. This refers to currency pairs which are non-USD, which doesn't have the USD you know, uh, denomination in it. So for example, let's say you have the euro crosses. Euro crosses simply means that the currency pairs that has the euro currency in it, like the euro against the British pound, euro against the Aussie dollar, euro against the New Zealand dollar. Then you have the pound crosses, like pound yen, pound against the Aussie dollar, pound against the New Zealand dollar, etc. Pretty, pretty simple stuff. And finally, the last type of currency pairs that we have is the exotic currency pairs. This is when one, ma when one major currency pair is paired with a developing country's currency. So for example, US dollar against the Mexican peso. US dollar is a major currency pair. And Mexican peso, right, this is a developing country's currency. So again, this meets the requirement, right? One major currency is paired with a developing country's currency. Next one, the euro against the T Turkish lira. Euro is a major currency. Turkish lira is a developing country's currency. And finally, the Indian rupee against the British pound. Again, so this is what we mean by exotic currency pairs. So one thing to note, right, is that when you trade exotic currency pairs, the spread tends to be wider. So if you don't understand what the spread means, right, don't worry, right, as you progress on in your trading journey, you'll understand. But in essence, right, the transaction cost to trade exo exotic currency pairs, they are more expensive compared to the uh, major currency pairs. So a quick recap, number one, currencies, they are traded in pairs, not as a standalone. The base currency is the first currency in the pair. The quote currency is the second currency in the pair. And then there are three types of currency pairs, major, cross, and exotics. So with that said, let's move on. So moving on in this section, you will learn number one, what is a pip? Number two, what is a pipette? And number three, how to read a currency pair code. So let's get started. So first and foremost, right, what is a pip? A PIP stands for percentage in point. In essence, right, what it's trying to do is to measure, it's a measure, right, of a change in value in a currency pair. Don't worry, we'll get to that later. So a PIP, right, remember, it's the fourth decimal place in a currency pair code. So let me explain, right? Let me give you an example. So let's see, let's say, right, euro against the US dollar moves from 1.3500 to 1.3505. Now let me ask you, where is where is the number to look at when you want to find out what is the, the PIP value change? So remember, 
pip is the fourth decimal place. So this is basically the fourth number after this dot. So one, two, three, four. You're looking at this number here. So you're comparing the difference between this number here and this number here. Okay? So quiz time. How many pips difference is this? So let's find out. And answer is quite straightforward. This is actually an increase, right, of five pips from 1.3500 to 1.3505. It's a difference of five pips. So you can see, right, the last digit, the fourth decimal placing digit, right, it has moved from zero to five. That's an increase of five pips. Let's do another example. Let's say this time around the euro against the dollar moves from 1.3400 to 1.3350. Now, how many pips is this? Right, let's uh, give you five seconds to figure this out. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, so the answer is a decrease of 50 pips. So in essence, right, this uh, euro against the dollar, it has dropped 50 pips from 1.3400 to 1.3350. So a quick tip that I have for you is that if you have difficulty, you know, you know, using your fingers, counting and stuff like that, you can just take a calculator, take this last four digit minus this last four digit and you'll get 50. Okay, that's another way to go about it. So moving on, one thing to share is that the yen pairs, they are special. They are not like, you know, the other currency pairs where the pip right is at the fourth decimal place. For yen pairs, like, you know, the dollar against the Japanese yen, the pound against the Japanese yen, the pip value is the second decimal place. So bear this in mind, only for yen pairs, the pip value, or rather the, the, the pip, the, the, the pip right, when you look at the currency code, right, is at the second decimal place. So let me give you an example. Let's say the dollar against the Japanese yen, moves from 100.10 to 100.15. How many pips is that? How many, uh, how much pips did this pair move? Again, very simple. You can just remember, second decimal place is where you look at for the pip for yen pair. So you just take uh, 15 minus 10 and your answer is an increase of five pips. Next one, another example. Let's say the dollar against the Japanese yen moves from 100.25 to 100.1. How many pips difference is this? Again, very simple. Take the uh, 1 0, which is 10, minus 25, and you get a decrease of 15 pips. And this is, in essence, right, how you, you uh, measure right, how many pips a currency pair has moved. And to take things a step further, because the Forex God, you know, like to make your life a bit more difficult, there's another thing called a pipette. And in essence, right, a PPEP is simply known as fractional PIPs. They are one-tenth the value of a PIP. Confusing? Don't worry. An example usually solves your pain. So, and one thing to bear in mind is that a PPEP is the fifth decimal place. For most currency pairs, for the yen pairs, it's the third decimal place. So, an example would, would ease your pain. Let's say euro against the dollar moves from 135005, which this one here is the PPEP, to... 1.3505, 7. This 7 here is the pipette value. So how many pips movement is this? So again, you just uh, do the simple math. You will realize that this is an increase of 5.2 pips. Makes sense? I know it makes sense, right? So let's do a quick recap. Number one, a pip is a measure of a change in value, right, in a currency pair. It's the fourth decimal place for most currency pairs except the yen, which is the third decimal place. If you want to be a little bit more, you know, particular, there's something called the pipette, which is in essence one ten of a pip. So in this section, what will you learn? You will learn number one, what is leverage? Number two, how leverage affects your trading. And finally, what are the different types of forex lot sizes? So let's get started. What is leverage? How leverage affects your trading? And what are the different types of Forex lot sizes? So let's begin. So what is leverage? So intuitively, I know you know what leverage means, but let's explain this when it comes to the Forex markets. So leverage is in essence, right? The ability to trade a larger amount of money relative to your account size. And leverage is a double H sword. And I'll explain more. So let me give you an example. Let's say you have $1,000 in your trading account and you buy $10,000 worth of Euro USD. This means you borrow the extra $9,000 to trade. And if you want to measure the leverage, this is a leverage of 1 to 10. Why is this a 1 to 10? You take the $10,000 that 
is worth of the euro usd divided by the initial capital that you have in your account and you get 10 so this is a leverage of 1 to 10. now the question is what if euro usd goes up how does leverage impact your trading so recall you have a thousand dollars account and you buy ten thousand dollars worth of euro usd your ten thousand dollars is now worth eleven thousand dollars why eleven thousand dollars very simple you just take ten thousand dollars and you multiply by 1.1 because you actually earn 10% because this currency pair went up 10%. So 10,000 minus, or rather multiply by 1.1 is equals to $11,000. Or if you look at it another way, 10% of 10,000 is 1,000. 1,000 plus 10,000 equals to 11,000. That's another way to, to do it. Next, you return the $9,000 that you owe. What you're left with is the $2,000. And remember, the $2,000, right, what you had initially at the start was $1,000. So in other words, your profit is $1,000. Right, $2,000 minus your original capital that you started with, you made a profit of $1,000 on this particular trade. And I know, man, Rainer, this looks easy. Man, I'm going to be the next market wizard millionaire trader. Well, not so fast, my young Padawan, because what if Euro USD goes down 10%? Then how would this change? So now, recall, you have a $1,000 account and you buy $10,000 dollars worth of euro usd your ten thousand dollars is now worth nine thousand why is that because ten thousand okay if you lose ten percent of your capital now it's worth nine thousand dollars you return the nine thousand dollars that you owe you're left with zero dollars in fact i have no idea why there's four zeros here but zero is zero is zero okay and uh, your original capital is a thousand dollars so this means your loss is a thousand dollars because you started off with a thousand dollars and you're left with zero 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 so in other words you lost thousand dollars so the key thing to point out is that leverage can amplify your gains and losses so if you think about this if without leverage this right would have been a 10 percent loss to you but because you use leverage you lost 100 percent instead of 10 percent so likewise when you had a gain earlier when you had a profit when the market went up 10 percent if you didn't use leverage that will be a profit of 10 percent for you but because you use a 1 to 10 leverage it is amplified 10 times you made a profit of a hundred percent so in this case it's a thousand dollars but in percentage term it's a hundred percent okay so this is uh pretty much the key thing that i want to point across is that leverage it can amplify your gains and losses and for this case in this example you lost 100 percent of your capital because uh, you use a 1 to 10 leverage if you didn't use leverage at all there would be a 10 percent loss of your capital moving on right i want to talk about forex lot sizes so what are the different types of forex lot size out there number one we have a standard lot, which is equivalent to 100,000 units. So when you key in 100,000 units to buy in your Forex broker, you are essentially buying one standard lot. Then below that, we have a mini lot, which is 10,000 units, followed by micro lot, which is 1,000 units. And smaller than micro lot, we even have nano lot, which is 100 units. So one thing to point out is that you can trade fractional lot sizes. It doesn't mean that you only can trade one standard lot, one mini lot, or five standard lots. You can, you know, break it up and trade something like 1.3 standard lot. You can trade 2.5 mini lots, 3.7 mini lots, 2.6 standard lot, 1.5 micro lots. It is all possible, right, when trading the Forex market. So in a way, you can, you know, better manage your risk as I will explain how that will work in the later section. So let's do a quick recap. Number one. Leverage is the ability, right, to trade a larger amount of money relative to your account size. And yes, you have seen, right, leverage is a double-edged double sword. It can amplify your gains or losses. And finally, we talk about, you know, the different types of lot sizes in the Forex market, standard lot, micro lot, mini lot, and nano lots. Okay, so in this section, you will learn what is a pip value and how to calculate a pip value. So what is a pip value? So a pip value, in essence, is trying to answer the question, how much is one pip worth? And to find that out, right, you need to answer two questions. Number one, the lot size that you're trading. And number two, the quote currency of the currency pair. So let me explain. Number one, the lot size. So as you know, right, in the Forex market, there are different lot sizes, you know, standard lot, mini lot, etc. So one standard lot, right, is actually equivalent to 100,000 units. And it's worth $10 per pip. One mini lot is 10,000 units and it's worth a dollar a pip. And one micro lot is a 1,000 units, which is 10 cents per pip or $0.1 a pip. And one thing to point out is 10 mini lots is actually equivalent to one standard lot. Because if you look at this, 10,000 units, you multiply by 10, it's 100,000 units. So in other words, 10 mini lot is one standard lot. So needless to say, 10 micro lots 
is equals to one mini lot, right? A thousand units you multiply by ten gives you ten thousand units. So ten micro lots, ten micro lots is one mini lot as well. Okay, so so bear this in mind. And this holds true only if your quote currency is US dollar, like Euro dollar, Aussie dollar, New Zealand dollar, etc. So clearly, right, what if your quote currency is not in US dollar? So this is why we need to look at the second thing, which is your quote currency. So let's say, for example, if the quote currency is in Euro, then one standard lot clearly is 10 Euro a pip. One mini lot is 1 Euro a pip, and one micro lot is 0.1 Euro per pip. Make sense? All right, so far so good. So let's have a look at an example. You trade Euro USD and buy 2.3 standard lots. How much is the value per pip? So if you just you know look at this, you know that 2.3 standard lot is equals to two standard lot and three mini lot. That's one way to look at it. Or you can look at it as 23 mini lot. That is the same thing. So depending how you want to look at this, let's say let's treat it as 23 mini lot. We know one mini lot is worth one dollar per pip. Okay. So clearly 23 mini lot means it's 23 dollars per pip and there you have it moving on next example let's say you trade the pound against the aussie dollar and buy 5.5 mini lots how much is the value per pip so again just remember the two things i shared with you number one what is the lot size traded 5.5 mini lots okay great next thing what is the quote currency aussie dollar great you know one mini lot is worth one dollar 5.5 mini lots means it's 5.5 dollars so what is the currency the quote currency this is aussie dollar so it's 5.5 aussie dollar per pip okay great so that should be the answer so if you look at the answer it's 5.5 how do i know this because uh, i did this slides and <laughs> and uh clearly i don't know what's the answer so yeah there you have it that's the answer so all this actually would be useful to you if right let's say your let's say right now your account currency is in australian dollar and yeah 5.5 aussie dollar per pip that would make sense but of course as you know there is no guarantee that the quote currency will be the same currency as your account funding. Maybe you could fund it in US dollar. You could fund it in Singapore dollars. It could be different. So how do you actually translate this PIP value into your own account currency if your own account currency is different from the quote currency? So this is where we can take things a step further and to find out the PIP value in your account's currency if the currency is different from the quote currency. So again, you need a few things. Number one, the lot size. Number two is the code currency. And number three is the exchange rate between the code currency and your account currency. So let me give you an example because example is your pain. Number one, let's say you buy one standard lot of Euro USD. Your account currency is in Singapore dollars. The exchange rate between the USD and SGD is 1.3. How much is the value per pip? So let's again right, do this uh, simple exercise you know one standard lot is a hundred thousand units Rainer say one standard lot is worth ten dollar per pip okay ten dollar per pip then you realize that your account currency is different from the quote currency so what now so what you need to do is to tr to convert right usd into sgd as you know right now one usd is worth 1.3 sgd so this means one us dollar is worth $1.30 Singapore dollar. So if I want to convert this 10 US dollars into Singapore dollars, I just take this, multiply by 1.3, and I have a figure of 13 Singapore dollars. SGD. Okay, and that's the answer, right? The value per pip will be 13 Singapore dollars per pip. And there you have it, right? In case you want to know the, the kind of like the math breakdown is 10 USD per pip multiplied by 1.3 because it's the exchange rate between US and Singapore dollars, and you get 13 Singapore dollars per pip. Another example, shall we, to really hammer home this concept. You buy two standard lots of pound against the New Zealand dollar. Your account currency is in Canadian dollars. The exchange rate for New Zealand Canadian is 1.5. How much is the value per pip? So I'm going to give you five seconds to do this. No, I'm just kidding. Five seconds is too fast. I'm, I'm going to do this together with you and, and let's find this out. But, you know, kind of like, you know, pause this video and do it on your own if you wish to. If not, I'm going to walk you through how to do this step by step. So again, first thing first, is the number of lots we are trading. Two standard lots. You know, that's equals to 20 New Zealand dollar per pip. Okay, if you do not know why it's 20, go and look back at the earlier slide so it makes sense. Your account currency is in Canadian dollar. Exchange rate between New Zealand and Canadian, Canadian dollar is 1.5. So what I need to do is for to find out 
how much is 20 New Zealand dollar worth in Canadian dollars? How much is that worth? Very simple. Just multiply it by the exchange rate, this prevailing exchange rate. Of course, this is not a real number. I just came up with this. If you just look at the normal Forex website, you will have, you can find out what's the prevailing exchange rate. So $20, I multiply by 1.5. It will give me, right, how much $20, or rather 20 New Zealand dollars is worth in Canadian dollars? And the answer is 30. 30 Canadian dollars per pip. Okay, so let's have a look. Ta-da! Okay, so so yeah, so with that said, right, let's do a quick recap. Number one, your pip value depends on a few things, the lot size, the code currency, and finally, right, the exchange rate between the code currency and your account currency, if they are different. If they are the same, then you just need the first two things and you can find out what is the pip value. So in this section, you will learn Number one, what is risk management and why it matters? Number two, what is position sizing? And finally, how to calculate your position size such that you never blow up blow up another trading account. So this topic that I'm about to share with you is very important, right? So pay close attention. So first and foremost, what is risk management? So if you ask me, risk management is the ability as a trader to encounter a series of losses, right? And not blow up your trading account. So for example, even if you sustain a series of 10 losses in a row, your trading account should be pretty much still intact. Yes, you have a bit of a losses along the way, but that account, right, should still have still have most of the money intact. So that's what risk management is all about. So it's important because you can have a winning trading strategy, but without proper risk management, right, you will still end up a losing trader. I can guarantee it. So let me share with you an example so you know what I mean. So let's say, for example, there are two traders. John and Sally, and they both have a $1,000 trading account to start with. Their trading strategy has a 50% winning rate, so this means they win half the time, and a 1 to 2 risk-reward ratio. So let me explain what risk-reward ratio is. So let's say, for example, you risk $100 on a trade, okay? That's the amount of money that you're willing to lose on a particular trade. And the outcome for you is favorable. Instead of losing $100, right, the market went in your favor and you made a profit of $200. So in other words, this $200 right, is two times the amount that you had intended to risk initially. So this is what we call a 1 to 2 risk-reward ratio. Your reward right, is two times your initial risk. So another example, let's say you have a $500 risk on the trade. And instead of you know losing that $500, market went in your favor and you made $5,000 instead. What is the risk to reward ratio on this trade? This is a risk to reward ratio of a one to 10. You were risking at $500 and you made $5,000 at the end of it. So this is a risk reward ratio of one to 10. Next, John risks $250 per trade and Sally risks $20 per trade. And let's say the outcome of the trades for both of them is in this sequence, right? L stands for losing, right? Lose, 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 then win, 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 win. So now what is the outcome for both traders? Let's look at John. You can see for John, he loses $250 because the first trade is a loser, loses another $250, another $250, another $250, and then he blow up. So before he could even smell the winner, he lost his entire trading account. On the other hand, let's have a look at Sally. As you can see, Sally goes through the same losing streak, right? She loses $20, lose $20, lose $20, lose $20, and then she made $40, $40, 40 and 40 because these were the string of winners at the end. But why $40 again? Because we have a 1 to 2 risk reward ratio, right, for their trading strategy. So if Sally risks $20 on each trade, and if the market, or rather if she achieves a 1 to 2 risk reward ratio, this means her profit is 2 times her initial risk. So 2 times of 20 is $40. So this is how we get $40. And at the end of it, Sally made a total return of $80. So that's about 8% gain on her account. Whereas you look at John, he actually lost 100% of his account. So hopefully, right, using this simple example, you can see the importance of risk management, right? In this case, both traders, they are trading with a winning strategy, but because of risk management, one of them loses his entire account and the other one is actually, you know, um, making some money, right, from trading the markets. So this is important. So now the question you might be thinking, okay, Rainer, I get it, right? Risk management is important, but how do I manage my risk? You know, how do I make sure that every time I put on a trade, right, I don't lose everything and more? So this is where the next topic comes into play. Position sizing. So what is position sizing? So position sizing is simply, right, trading the right number of units, right, such that even if a trade 
ends up being a loser. It's only a fraction of your trading account. Okay, let me repeat once again, right? Position sizing is knowing, right, how many units you should trade such that if that trade goes against you, you only lose a fraction of your trading account. And as a general guideline, I usually advocate, right, not to lose more than 1% of your trading account on each trade. So for example, let's say if your account is like a $10,000 trading account, 1% of 10,000 is $100. So this means every trade you put on, you should not lose more than $100 on each trade. And now brings us to the question, right? How do we, you know, calculate that in such a manner where, you know, you know, you won't lose more than $100 on each trade. So to do that, you need to know a few things, okay? So this is kind of like the secret formula, right? So position size is equals to the amount to risk, right? The amount of uh, dollar that you're willing to risk divided by your stop loss multiplied by value per pip. So amount to risk is usually, I, I recommend 1% risk on each trade. Some, some traders will go with 2 or 3%. Uh, that's pretty much, you know, up to an individual trader. And after which you divide it by your stop loss multiplied by your value per pip. So I'm going to share with you a very simple uh, way to do this, okay? You, you don't have to... So I'll just go with you a manual way and then after which I show you how to do it with a faster way. So let's say you're risking $100. You're willing to risk $100. And let's say, you know, your stop loss is, let's say, 100 pips. Okay, so you put it 100. And your value per pip, right, let's say you're trading Euro USD is uh, $10 per pip for a standard lot. So you put here 10. Okay, you plug in the numbers, you get 100 divided by 1,000. And if you do it, you end up with 0 0.1 standard lot, which is equivalent to one mini lot. So the trouble with this is that your value per pip is constantly changing. It really depends on the code currency. It depends on the account funding that you, you have funded with your, with your account. So you can see that, you know, things can get really cumbersome, right? So one thing I suggest is to use a position sizing calculator to make your life really easy. And I'm going to show you how to do this step by step. So you can Google, you know, position sizing calculator. And this is one that I've found. You can, you know, use it. It's free. So let's say you're trading again, Euro USD. Your account currency, let's say, is in US dollar. Let's say your account size is like what I shared earlier, $10,000. And your risk on each trade, let's say, is 1%. You can put here 1%. In this case, you can even switch to, you know, dollar terms. Let's say you want to risk $100, which is also 1%. That is fine as well. But in this case, let's go with the percentage. Let's say 1%. Let's say your stop loss in pips, right, is 100 pips. Put in 100. Contract size, let's leave it at 100,000, which is equal to one standard lot. You click calculate. And there you have it, right? It tells you the lots to trade is 0 0.1, which is equals to 0 0.1 standard lot or one mini lot. Can you see how fast this is? Let's do another example. Let's say this time around, you're not trading Euro USD. You're trading pound against the Aussie. Let's say your account currency is in New Zealand dollars. Okay, and let's say this time you're a baller, your account size is $100,000. And you're a baller and you still risk 1% on each trade. Well done. And let's say your stop loss this time around is 350 pips. Contract size again, 100,000. You click calculate, it will tell you how many units to trade, right? Such that if even if the trade hits your stop loss, you will only lose 1% of your account. So you click calculate. And in this case, it tells you that you can trade 0 0.263 standard lot, which is about 26, uh, sorry, uh, 2.63 mini lots. Make sense? So again, this is very useful. So again, let's, you know, interpret this together. So this means, right? For this particular uh, pound or Z trade, and let's say your account is in New Zealand dollars and you're risking 1% of this $100,000, this means, right, if the trade goes against you, right, with a stop loss of 350 pips, right, you will lose, right, $1,000, 1000 New Zealand dollars, right, in your trading account, which is the 1% that we have defined over here, right? And this is the position size that you should be trading with, 2.6 mini lots, okay? Make sense? So this is how you use a position sizing calculator. So again, let's do one more example so you really understand this big time. So let's say this time around we do something simple like Aussie dollar. You want to trade the Aussie against the US dollar. Let's say your account currency is in Aussie dollar. How about that? Same, uh, uh, just put Aussie dollar. Let's say your account size this time around is $5,000. And let's say you are risking a little bit more, 2% risk on each trade, which is still about uh, $100. So your stop loss this time around, let's say it's only 50 pips. Okay, contract size again, 100,000 units. So now the question is how many units right should you be trading such that if this trade goes against you and hit your 50 pip loss the loss of, on this trade is only two percent of your account two percent of this five thousand dollars five thousand aussie dollars click calculate and it tells you that you should only be trading 1.53 mini lots make sense okay so don't worry i'll share with you a, uh we'll talk more about you know position sizing risk management with chart examples later on but for now i just want you to to know how to use this very useful calculator just click google there are many free available ones and just pick whichever that you know you're comfortable with 
So let's do a quick recap. Number one, position sizing is the tool to manage your risk. And use a, posi a position sizing calculator right, to make your life easier. I don't expect you to manually you know, calculate it. Most brokers usually have an inbuilt calculator function. If it doesn't have, right, then just you know, you go to any of the free website via Google and you can use the calculator to help you calculate the number of units to trade such that you know, even if the trade is a losing trade, right, you, you only lose a fraction of your account. Now, moving on, let's talk about the different types of Forex orders, right? So in this section, it's all about, you know, learning the different types of Forex orders. And one thing to point out is that uh, there are many more different types of orders that you can use, especially when you're using professional trading platforms. But the ones that I'm about to share with you right now is I would say the ones that you are likely to use, right, most of the time. Okay, so let's get started. First one, market order. Second one is a limit order. Third one is a stop order. And finally, a stop loss order. Order. So let me explain each one of them step by step. First one is a market order. So let's say it's a buy market order, order because it could also be a, a sell market order. The concept is the same, but in this case, let's go with, let, let's say a buy market order. This is in essence, right? You're trying to, you know, buy at the current market price right now, no matter what. So this is like, you know, sending an order to your brokerage platform and say, hey, I want to enter Euro USD right now, no matter what, now. So your broker will fill you at a trade at the current prevailing price. So the pros to it is that, you know, you're guaranteed to enter a trade. There's no what if, but or whatsoever. You're guaranteed to enter a trade. But the downside to this is you might get slippage, right, during fast moving markets. And you might be thinking, you know, Reyna, what is slippage, man? So here's the thing, right? In the Forex market, yes, it's liquid most of the time. But when it, when there's a big piece of news coming out, like let's say, you know, NFP, non-farm payrolls or FOMC meetings, right? Let's say Euro USD is currently trading at 13000, right? But during fast moving markets, you if you hit market order, right, you could get slippage, right? Where you thought, hey, I'm gonna buy at 1.3, but you end up, you know, buying actually at 130, let's say 20. You had, end up paying 20 pips more than expected. So this is kind of like the downside to using market order because of this uh slippage. So instead of you know buying at 1.3000, you end up buying at 1.3020 a slippage of 20 pips. So in other words, you're paying 20 pips more than you expected. Okay, so this is a market order. The other type of market order, right, is limit order. So again, let's talk about buy limit order. Sell limit order is just the opposite. So for a buy limit order, right, it's an order, an order to buy below the current market price. So let me give you an example. So let's say market is in a range between these highs and this lows in goes up, comes down, goes up, and now it's in the middle. And you think to yourself, ah, man, price right now is in the middle, right? I want to buy, I want to be a cheapskate. I want to buy the best price. And it seems like the best price is near this lows over here. And let's say this is Euro USD. This lows is around 1.5. Okay, so what you can do is you can place a buy limit order at 1.5000, so such that if the market comes down into this level, you will get filled on that buy trade. But of course, if the market doesn't come down, you won't get filled. So that is uh, kind of like the, the pros and cons to using a buy limit order. So let me give you a, a chart example you can so you can see what I mean. So this is, uh, for example, pound Canadian. Let's say you're looking at this chart maybe on the eight hour time frame, okay? And you zoom out a little bit and you realize, oh, this, this market, right? This seems like a good place to buy. This is an area of support. Don't worry if uh, you're not familiar with this technical term, I'll explain more in the later section. But let's say, hey, you want to buy around 172, right? This looks like a good place to buy because the market has bounced once, twice, you know, and three times over here. This looks like a good place to buy. But the current market price is at this point over here, which is almost near 1735. So what can you do? You can place a buy limit order over here, a buy limit at 1.72. So this means only if the market comes down low enough into this 1.72 level. Only then will you get filled. If not, you won't be in this trade. So this is what a buy limit order means. So of course, right, the good thing about it is that you get to buy at the price you want. The downside is you might not get filled on the trade. So maybe you're waiting for the level, but the market doesn't come to the level and instead, it, it, you know, it, rev it continues, you know, going up higher. Then clearly, right, you wouldn't, you know, be in the trade. So vice versa, right, for a sell limit order, the, the concept is just the opposite. So moving on, the third type of order is a stop order. So again, let's talk about buy stop order. So this in, in essence, right, is to an order to buy only if the market moves above a specific price level. So you might be thinking, hmm, what does that mean? So again, I can give you an example. Let's say market is, uh, let's say it's trending higher. 
it goes up, pulls back, goes up, pulls back, and it's starting to go up. And you tell yourself, hmm, I'm looking at this chart, and it would make sense, right, that I want to buy only if the price can break above these highs. Because if it can break above these highs, then there's a good chance that this market could continue higher. So you want to tell yourself, I will only buy if the price can break above this high. If it doesn't break above this high, I will not, you know, enter a trade. So what you can do is to use a buy stop order. So an example is this one here. If you look at this chart, dollar against the Chinese yuan, this is the eight hour time frame. So again, you can look at this and say, hmm, at this point, right, Rainer, I have no idea. Maybe the price might go up and come back down, you know, and again, I don't want to enter right now because, you know, this could happen. And then you're thinking to yourself, I feel more confident if the price can break above these highs. Only then I would be willing to buy. So if that's your thought process, what you can do is you can use a buy stop order. You can place a buy stop order at this price, around $6.59, around this price point, which is somewhere about here. So you can place a buy stop order here. Let's call it BS, buy stop, not, 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 not BS that you're familiar with, but buy stop order at $6.59. So such that if the price goes up and breaks above $6.59, this is an order that will automatically you know, get you into this trade. Right, because it broke it broke about broke above this key level 659 that you have you know uh, put into your broker platform so it's an order to buy if the price moves above a specific price level so this is useful right if you are trading breakouts this uh, order is you know absolutely useful because in breakout trading the price will break out of a specific level and then you'll continue with the momentum right to hit higher so if you have a buy stop order you are you know kind of like assured to enter right if the price could break out of a level the downside to this is that it might be a false breakout. So again, what could happen is that let's say pound, the dollar against the Chinese yuan. So this is the highs. Price could go up, break out, and then boom, reverse. Right? This is possible as well. Anything can happen in the market. So this is a uh, one possibility that could happen, right? If you are, you know, using buy stop order to enter a trade. So the next type of order, right, will be a uh, stop loss order. So the first three orders that I shared with you, right, those are orders right to get you into a trade so for stop loss order is the opposite because this is an order to get you out of a trade so so let's say we are going with a, a long entry okay so a stop loss order is an order to sell your position if the price exceeds a specific level so for example let's say you market is in a range up down up down they start to go up okay and this is the area of support and you start to buy over here Okay, and what happens is that, you know, as you know, in trading, nothing is certain. There's a possibility that this market could continue to reverse down lower and lower. And if you don't bail out of your trade in time, right, you could, you know, lose a lot of money. So this is where you can use a stop loss order and say, you know, hey, you can tell your broker, hey, you know what? If the market, you know, breaks below this level in rate, okay, if the market reaches this level in rate, I want to get out of that trade. So to tell that, you will tell your broker to set a stop loss order at this particular price. Let's say this price is at two dollars right and you will exit your trade so this is what we mean by a stop loss order It's an order to sell your position if the market moves against you and reaches a specific price level so a chart example would help so let's say you look at dollar against usd against the singapore dollars so you can look at this right market right now looks a little bit bullish right this area of support and it's starting to hit higher but of course as you know market could possibly you know reverse down and break lower so to protect your downside, what you can do is to set a stop loss order. Okay, so this is the area of support and what I would say a, a proper stop loss order could possibly be at 133.6 level around here. So this means right, you can tell your broker and say, hey, you know, I, I am long USD against the Singapore dollars, but I know the trade can go against me. So I'm going to set a stop loss order at 1.336. So if the market let's say reverse down lower and hit my stop loss level, which is this one over here, the stop loss level, I will want to sell the position that I have to protect my downside so I can leave to fight another day. So this is how a stop loss order works. It's to protect your downside. Okay. And of course, right, the downside to using a stop loss order is that you might get stopped out of your trade prematurely. So what could happen also is that, okay, let's say you set your stop loss at this level here. There is, no, there is, you know, nothing to stop the market from you know, coming down lower. Where you hit your stop loss and then reverse up higher. That could also happen. So this is kind of like the downside, downside to using a stop loss order. But as a Forex trader, as a trader who uses leverage in your trading, I still suggest to use a stop loss order. Sometimes, yes, this could happen. It sucks. But in the grand scheme of things, right, you will 
likely right have a longevity in your trading career because your losses right are always kept small and that's achieved by using proper risk management and position sizing and again those are things that you have learned earlier and we'll revisit them later with chart examples but for now i just want you to be familiar with a stop loss order okay and the opposite for stop loss order right is can be used for both a long trade and a short trade the concept is the same just you know the inverse so let's say for example you are in a short trade let's say market comes up into this area of resistance and you sell right you can put your stop loss order above this high so if the market breaks out higher you would exit this trade if the market hits your stop loss at this particular price point so it's just the inverse right of a long entry so let's do a quick recap right of the four market orders you have just learned number one market order gets you into a trade immediately no matter what a limit order gets you into a trade only if it comes to a specific price level that you have dictated a stop order gets you into a, a trade if the market exceeds a certain price level. For example, let's say buying breakout. Only if it, let's say, breaks above, uh, let's say, $100 will you be entering the breakout trade. So that's what a stop order, a buy stop order can do for you. And finally, a stop loss order right, would get you out of a trade if the market, you know, uh, exceeds a certain price level to protect your downside. Now, moving on, in this section, you will learn the two prices in the financial markets, not just the forex markets. What is the spread and why it matters and how to reduce the spread okay so let's get started the two prices in the market so here's the thing right when you are trading in the forex market the stock market or any of the financial markets there is always two prices so they are number one the bid the bid is the price which you can sell at and the ask this is the price which you can buy at so this concept is the same as, you know, going to a money changer. Whenever you, let's say, for example, you want to, you know, buy and sell a certain currency, let's say euro against the USD, you are always being quoted two prices, the bid and the ask. And it's the same concept over here. So let me uh, share with you, you know, and explain what this means. So the bid, right, let's say, for example, if you look at a chart, I'm going to bring up my charts over here. You see, this is the dollar, the USD against the Singapore dollar. This over here is the bid, and this is the ask. So as of right now, if I want to sell the US dollar against the Singapore dollar, I can sell it at 1.34101. And if I want to buy US dollar against the Singapore dollar right now, I will look at this blue box, and I can buy it at 134.115. Make sense? So there's always two prices, right, which is being quoted in the Forex market, the bid and the ask. And depending, you know, what you're trying to do, if you're trying to buy, then of course you will pay attention and see what's the asking price. If you're looking to sell, if you're looking to short a currency pair, you will pay attention to what is the bid price. What is the spread? Well, the spread very simply is this. It's the difference between the bid and the ask. So let's say, for example, Euro USD is trading at 13500. This is the bid. And the ask is trading at 13501. This is the ask. So the difference, right, between the bid and the ask in this case is one pip. So this is the spread on Euro USD. And now you might be wondering, hey Reynald, you know, why does the spread matter, man? You know, what has it got to do with me? Well, a lot, right? It has to do a lot with you and your own trading. And here's why. Spread, right? If you look at it, right, you can look at it in the form of transaction cost. In Forex trading, most of you probably don't pay commission to your broker. So your transaction cost is in the form of a spread. So let me explain how this works. So the higher the spread, the higher your transaction cost. And likewise, the lower the spread, the lower your transaction cost. And I'm going to give you an example so you can see what I mean. So let's say you buy one standard lot of Euro USD and the spread is 3 pips. How much does the spread cost you in, in dollar terms? So you know, as we have you know discussed earlier, one standard lot is 100,000 units, 100,000 units. And the value per pip is $10. So if your spread is three pips, this means, right, the moment you put on a trade, when you trade one standard lot of euro, this should be USD, I'm not sure why it's I, okay? When you buy one standard lot of euro USD, you are immediately down $30 on this trade. That is the cost of the spread in terms of US dollar to you. So, if you think about this, right, what if the spread now is one pip? Can you see how much of a difference this makes? If the spread now is 
one pip. The cost to you is just ten dollars. See, see what I mean by having a wide spread and a tight spread. The higher the spread, the more expensive your transaction cost is gonna be. The lower the spread, the cheaper your transaction cost is gonna be. So now the question is, how can you reduce the cost of the spread? So one thing to point out is that uh, it's near impossible to you know tell your broker to give you a tight spread right because it's pretty much fixed and there's nothing you can do about it but what you can do on your end is this focus on major currency pairs so as mentioned earlier major currency pairs these are the most popular currency pairs that are actively traded in the world and if you look at their spread right they are usually right smaller tighter than the other currency pairs like the exotic or even the uh the uh cross currency pair so let me share this with you and you can see over here i'm going to pull up trading view if you look at uh, daily time frame, and in case you guys are wondering, right, this platform is TradingView. It provides uh, charting services in case if you need it. So if you look at Euro USD, you can see what is the spread right now. So for example, the difference between the bid and ask is actually shown over here in this middle. The spread on Euro USD right now is 0 0.2 pips. If you look at pound dollar, the spread now is about 0 0.3. It's moving you know, up and down. Just pay attention to this portion here, about 0 0.5. And if you look at Aussie against the dollar, it's about 0 0.23. 0 0.2 right now but what if you look at other currency pairs maybe you look at you know something like the cross currency pair like pound new zealand the spread here is now 1.2 if you look at something exotic like dollar against the Tur turkish lira is 66.3 pips so you can see right if you want to have you know lower transaction costs right focus on major currency pairs the spreads are usually tighter usually lower and another thing that you can do is to trade the higher time frame so the cost of your spread is lower in terms of percentage so let me explain what this means. So let's say you have one pip spread with a five pips stop loss. If you think about it, right, your spread is 20%, right, of the size of your stop loss. So let's say if your stop loss is five pips, your spread is one pip, right, the spread as a function of your stop loss eats up about 20% of it. So this means, right, in essence, your stop loss is only four pips. If the market moves four pips against you, you are going to get stopped out of your trade. On the other hand, if you have a one pip spread, but your stop loss is 100 pips, and the reason why you can afford a 100 pip stop loss is because you're trading off the higher time frame. You have a wider stop loss, right? Because you're trading on a higher time frame. In this case, the one pip spread is only 1% of the size of your stop loss. So in terms of cost, it's only 1% of the size of your stop loss. So you can see that in a way, right, your spread, right, you're paying, or rather, a percentage of your stop loss is smaller when you have a wider stop loss and to have a wider stop loss is usually because you are trading off the higher time frame and if you think about this if you trade on the five minutes chart or the 15 minutes chart the price action right the way the candle moves up and down right the range is usually smaller compared to trading off the daily time frame where the range is much larger so when you are trading off the higher time frame with a larger range it makes sense to have a wider stop loss to accommodate right the larger swings on that time frame so this is why if you trade off the higher time frame your stop loss is usually wider and if your stop loss is wider you will realize that the spread right as a function of your stop loss right in terms of percentage is usually lower compared to you know let's say you trade off the one minute or five minutes time frame the spread as a function of your stop loss right is usually wider and you're gonna you know end up pay more in transaction costs so let's do a quick recap number one the spread is the difference between the bid and ask the bid is the price that you can sell at the ask is the price that you can buy at number two the lower the spread the lower your transaction costs and finally, if you want to reduce the cost of the spread, what you can do is to focus on the major currency pairs or trade off the higher time frames. Hey, hey, what's up, my friend? Man, I miss saying that because, you know, these videos actually, they're all done separately and then stitched up together because if I were to say hey, hey, at the start of every section, right, you're going to get irritated by me. So anyway, welcome back. Uh, in this section, you will learn the different types of Forex traders. And, you know, let me explain. So there are different types of forex traders out there. You can classify them as short-term traders, medium-term traders, and long-term traders. So let's analyze, you know, uh, what are the differences right, between these type of traders. Number one, short-term traders. So for short-term traders, right, your time frame, it's usually below the one hour time frame. You will likely operate on the five minutes, 15 minutes time frame. Your potential target in terms of pips, right, you're usually aiming anywhere between five to 50 pips. 
and your holding time it's usually less than three days and one thing to to share is that whatever i'm sharing with you is just general guideline it's not really cast in stone because short-term traders there are some really really short-term traders like scalpers who can be in a trade for just a few minutes and then you have some short-term traders traders which are slightly longer which could be under day traders where they could hold their trade for a day or two so what i'm sharing here is just uh, a general guideline right to to take into consideration next one medium term traders so these are the type of traders who trade between the one and four hour time frame their potential target is usually anywhere between 50 to 200 pips and they can hold their trades anywhere between three to ten days and finally you have the long-term trader who trades right the four hour time frame and above could be the four hour eight hour daily or even a weekly time frame then their potential target is usually you know more than 200 pips on each trade that they are aiming for and they can hold their trades you know for 10 days or more weeks or even months so a super quick recap this is a fast section right so you have short-term traders medium-term traders and long-term trader and personally for me, I'm a medium to long-term trader. So the key here right, to share with you is to get you to understand the different type of uh, trading timeframes that you can be on and to find a type of trading style that suits you. Are you more towards short-term trading, medium-term trading or long-term long -term trading? And the only way to find out is to through trial and error, right? You know, trading across the different timeframes to see what works for you. And also another thing is time commitment plays a part because if you have a full-time job it's unlikely that you can be a short-term trader because you just can't afford to be glued in front of the screen right all day to watch the markets while having a full-time job so probably i would say medium term to long-term trading would suit you best but on the other hand let's say you are a someone who's very free uh you have a lot of time and you have you know interest in short-term day trading then hey you know maybe that is something for you but ultimately you have to explore experiment trial and error to see which type of trading approach would suit you best Boom shakalaka. Boom shakalaka. Hi, my name is Rainer. Pleased to meet you. All right, stop, stop messing around. So in this section, right, you will learn, number one, what is technical analysis, what is market structure, what is an area of value, what is an entry trigger, and more importantly, how do you use technical analysis in your trading? So let's get started. So first thing first, what is technical analysis? So I define technical analysis as using past data to help you make your trading decisions. And this past data could be things like volume, indicators, chart patterns, candlestick patterns, etc. And of course, right, technical analysis is not the only way to trade the markets because you also have things like fundamental analysis, sentiment analysis. But me, primarily, I'm a technical trader. So this is why in this video, I would focus more on technical analysis. And I want to share with you the three things, right, that you should focus on, right, when you kickstart this trading career of yours. So technical analysis, right, I would say there are three components which is very important to master. The first component here is what I call market structure. So here's the thing, right? When you look at the price chart, the, the first thing that comes to your mind should be, you know, hmm, should I be buying? Should I be selling? Or should I stay out of the markets? That's really the first thing that should come to your mind. You shouldn't, you know, look at the chart and say, oh, let me buy now. Oh, let me sell now. No, you should first ask yourself, is this the type of price action? Is this chart telling me that I should be looking for buying opportunities? or selling opportunities, or maybe I should stay out completely of this market. This is the first question, right, that you must answer. And everything else, right, is secondary. So the way to do that, right, is market structure helps you to answer this question. It tells you what to do. So market structure helps you to define the current market condition. So you know whether to be buying, selling, or staying out of the market. So let's dive a little bit deeper into market structure. So market structure, there are different types of market structure. But for this video, I will share with you three broad categories of market structure. Number one being an uptrend if you know a stock or sorry <laughs> a market is in an uptrend not necessarily stock can be currency pairs etc you want to look for buying opportunities so let me explain to you what an uptrend is so in the grand scheme of things grand scheme of things an uptrend forms a series of higher highs and higher lows so it looks something like this market goes up but as you know market doesn't go up in one straight line it goes up it needs to take a breather it needs to pause and then it makes a pullback then once the pullback ends it will continue up higher breaking above this previous swing high this previous high if you want to call it then it goes up again it doesn't go up in one straight line it needs to take a breather pause once it pause once it rests finish and then it continues up higher breaking out above the previous swing high again and then the pattern rinse repeat itself so when you look at this you would notice that an uptrend consists of a series of higher highs and higher low look at this high another higher high i'll cluster this as one and another higher high if you look at the lows it's a higher low higher low higher low okay had to do that 
So this is what I mean by an uptrend, a series of higher highs and higher lows. And if you see a market has this market structure, this currency pair has this market structure, then what do you want to do? Well, you want to look for buying opportunities because the market is in an uptrend. The path of least resistance is higher. So this is why you want to be looking for buying opportunities. So if you see a chart that looks like this, tell yourself, promise me, you will only look for buying opportunities, right? You don't want to look for selling opportunities. Not that it can't be done. There are traders who specialize in counter trend trading, but for you, the beginner, it's much easier to be trading along the path of least resistance, trading in the direction of the trend than against it. Okay, so uptrend, look for buying opportunities. Next one, downtrend. This is just the reverse. You want to look for selling opportunities. So downtrend, right, in essence, is a series of lower highs and lower lows. So market heads down lower, makes a pullback, heads down lower again, breaking below the previous low, makes a pullback, heads down lower, breaking the previous low. Sometimes it could consolidate and then break down lower once again, breaking below the previous swing low. So if you look at it, you will notice a series of lower high, lower high, lower high, and lower low. Lower low, lower low. So if you see a market is in a downtrend, then what should you be doing? Buying or selling? Well, the path of least resistance is towards the downside. So promise me when you see a chart that's in a downtrend, you only think of selling opportunities. Okay, that's the path of least resistance. And finally, you have what we call a range market. And in this market condition, you can you know, be both a buyer or seller. So a range market looks something like this. Price is contained between the highs and the lows. So when the market is in a range, right, you can look for both buying and selling opportunity. And one thing to point out is again, how do you know a market is in a range is where you see the, the highs of the range, right? The price just keep testing it, right? But unable to break out higher. Compared to an uptrend, the price is able to break above the previous swing highs, it's able to break above the highs. But in a range, it's just, you know, getting rejected at the highs consistently over here. Same for the, the lows of the range. It just cannot break down lower. It's just, you know, contained uh, above the lows of the range. So you can think like the price right, is being trapped like in a, in a big giant box, just can't get out of it. So with that said, let's have a look at a few chart examples so you know how this looks like. Because one thing to, to know is the theory is one thing, but when you tr look at the live charts, the market, it can look completely different out of whack. Like one is in, in, uh, one is in heaven and one is on earth. So it's going to be quite different. So I want to walk through with you, right? when you look at the chart. So if you look at this chart, New Zealand against the Swiss franc, this is the daily time frame as you can see over here on the daily chart. What market structure is this? Well, if you notice this, this market in the grand scheme of things is forming a series of higher highs and higher lows. Higher high, higher high, higher high, higher high, higher high, and higher low. Higher low, higher low, higher low, higher low. There's another minor one over here, okay? So yeah. So we can see that in the grand scheme of things, in the big picture, if you look from left, left to right, this market is heading higher. It's in a uptrend. And if a currency pair, if a market is in an uptrend, what should you be doing? Looking for buying opportunities or selling opportunities? I'm sure you got the answer. Okay, so let's have a look at another one. Dollar against Canadian. Okay, so if you look at this again, this pair, just identify the highs and lows on the chart. This is the highs, the highs, the highs, 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 the highs, the highs, and the low, the low, 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 and low. So you look from left to right, where is this currency pair heading over time? It's heading down lower. So in other words, you can say that the US dollar is depreciating against the Canadian dollar over, you know, over the last, this uh, number of months over here that you see at the bottom. Okay, so this is in the downtrend. And one thing to also share is that when you look at a chart, right, there are many swing points. What I call a swing point is the highs and lows on the chart that kind of stick out like a sore thumb, which is very obvious. Like, you know, this is a swing high, this is a swing high. I won't consider this a swing high because this is, isn't as obvious. This isn't as in your face kind of thing. So when you want to identify the series of higher highs and higher lows on the chart, pay attention to the swing points, the one that really stick out like a sore thumb, right? The minor ones you can just pretty much ignore it because if you try to pay attention to every single minor highs and lows on the chart, you will get confused, right? And lose the big picture. So for example, let's say you look at this over here. You might look at this, oh, hey, Rainer, the price, you know, broke out of the, the, uh, this high, man. You know, this looks like an uptrend. So I know it sounds silly, but you know, sometimes when you get too fixated on trading in the now, you might actually think along those lines. So just remember, pay attention to the major swing points. If you're unsure, look from left to right, left to right. Don't just look at the last five, six candles. Look, 
look from look at a big picture perspective bird eyes view that is important okay so dollar against the canadian we can both agree that this is in a downtrend moving on british pound against canadian dollar in this case i'll go to the weekly time frame okay and you can see over here what is this market condition and oh yeah before i continue dollar against the canadian daily time frame okay in this current market structure what do you want to be doing buying or selling i'm sure you want to look for selling opportunities that's the path of least resistance next one pound against canadian so if you look at this one again what is this market structure well you can see that this one's a little bit different it's a bit different from the earlier ones this market seems to be contained between these highs and these lows we'll talk more about this exact highs and lows what is the terminology and how you can use them in your trading later on but for now just pay attention that this market is kind of contained in in a box stuck between the highs and the lows and this is what we call a range market and in a range market you can look to buy low and sell high buy near this low or sell near this high but personally for me i like to trade trends okay but i still want to share with you what a range market looks like because hey some of you might go on to be you know pro range traders in future but for me personally i simply like to trade trends buy in uptrend and sell in downtrend so but nonetheless this is what we call a range market you can look to buy near the lows and sell near the highs and one, one couple more examples you can see this one british pound against the us dollar what is this market structure so again if you look at this this overall seems to be in an uptrend right series of higher highs higher highs higher highs and higher lows higher low higher low higher low higher low and possibly high, this higher low so you can see that you know this right if you are again too fixated in the now you might think that ah rainer this looks like you know a, a, a downtrend man look rainer this market has made a lower high and a lower low this market is in a downtrend yes I, I get it right if you look at just those few candles right you uh you can think that it's a downtrend but you know let's take a step back and look from left to right again you want to make sure that you are taking a bird eyes view and not just looking at an individual tree and missing the forest this is uh, a mistake that i don't want you to make so if you look from left to right you can see that this market overall is in an uptrend okay so this will be a swing the next uh, or rather the, the swing low that is pretty much still intact if the market right can break below this low and this low over here then hey then maybe you know you can see that this uptrend is getting weak right maybe the trend is starting to reverse but again i don't you know take things too far out of hand because there is where, where we go into more advanced technical analysis but for now looking at the big picture i would say the pound against the us dollar looking from left to right this market is in an uptrend and i'm looking for buying opportunities and don't worry you know about you know hey where to buy how much to buy when to buy we'll cover all that stuff later on now just focus on this market structure and once one last final example is euro against the us dollar so if you look at this this market is it in an uptrend or is it in a range so you can see that you know this chart i purposely picked this one up because when you deal with technical analysis there is subjectivity involved and if you say this is an uptrend some traders are going to say this in a range i wouldn't say anyone is right or wrong because it's kind of like in between the it's kind of like in between okay so personally i'll, I'll stay that this market is more towards the range right given this uh, price chart that i'm looking at right now this will be the lows of the range and this is the high even though this high is just tested one time some might argue no arena this is an uptrend no higher high higher low fine that's your point of view so this is why as a discretionary trader as a technical trader there is always you know someone with an opposing view of yours so and one thing to also point out is that if a chart doesn't speak up to you if it if a chart right makes you feel confused and frustrated and you do not know what to do remember you always have the option to stay out of the markets move on onto something else no one is pointing a gun at your head and saying, hey to put on a damn trick man no no one is doing that so if it's not clear if it's conflicting information move on onto another currency pair does it make sense now moving on number two area of value so you've learned right what is market structure earlier if the market is in an uptrend you want to look for buying opportunities but here's the thing just because a market is in an uptrend doesn't mean you blindly hit the buy button no because the trend right could be about to make a reversal it could be, could be about to make a pullback so this is why you want to look for this next second thing an area of value so this is like you know going on a date with a girl for the first time doesn't mean you go on a date once you're going to marry her because you don't not know what type of person is she does she really like you do you really like her you know you need more confirmation and it's the same for trading we are looking for more confirmation to give us clue that this is a good time to enter into an uptrend okay so the second thing is what i call an area of value so this in essence right tell you 
tells you right where to buy or sell. So market structure, previously it tells you what to do. Should you be looking for buying opportunities or selling opportunities? But it doesn't mean hit the buy button. No, you are only looking for opportunities, whether to buy or sell. For this one, it tells you where to buy or sell. The keyword here is where, where on the chart to buy or sell. So area of value, really, it's about this. To help you pinpoint the area on your charts to look for trading opportunities and to to look for areas of value on your chart there are numerous tools that you can use but for me personally i use support resistance and moving average often and so this is the two things the two tools that i want to share more with you so support and resistance otherwise known as sr so what is support and resistance so here's my definition of it so support is an area on your chart where buying pressure could step in i didn't say mass right because in trading nothing is guaranteed trading is all about probabilities never certainty so it's an area on your chart where buying pressure could maybe come in to push the price higher so it looks something like this let's say market is in a range so support is at near the lows of this range this is what we call support right where buying pressure came in and pushed the price up higher buying pressure came in pushed the price up higher support is here buying buyers came in and pushed the price up higher so let's say now price is at support what's going to happen go up no it could also go down okay so this is why i say that it's an area on your chart where buying pressure could step in so next resistance this is an area on your chart where selling pressure could step in so again this is an area of resistance over here where the price came up hit down lower went up kept down lower went up and what happens came down lower so again anything can happen in markets it can go up it can break out of resistance or it can face selling pressure resistance and then reverse down lower once again so this is why the word is could could step in so now that you understand what is support and resistance so in essence right support is where buyers could come in and push the price up higher resistance is an area on your chart where sellers could come in and push the price down lower and another thing to add is that when support is broken it tends to become or it could become resistance so let's say this is support okay so support 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 right previous support could now become resistance right where price where price could face selling pressure and then continue lower down for, from here and vice versa if resistance is broken that area could now become support let's say this is resistance up down up down up down up breakout come back previous resistance 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 could become support and the price could possibly head up higher from here so let me share with you a few charts right? so you can kind of like let this concept sink into your head so first one here is pound canadian so if you look at this uh weekly time frame chart which i've marked you can see where is your support and resistance area support right tested once twice three times four times and your resistance tested once over here and this is why i said it's an area on your chart if you look at this over here the price didn't respect this level to the pit in fact you break out people thought it's a breakout and then came back collapsed back into the range once again okay so if another one over here almost touching almost touching they broke out went back in the range again and then this was almost near to the pit and then went back into the range again so this is why we are dealing with an area but the reason why i draw support resistance as lines is because it's my habit right? it's uh, something that i've been so used to doing but if you don't want to uh to to face this problem of you know treating this as a a line or whatsoever you can use a tool right i think it's called the rectangle tool to make your life easier this one over here so what you can do is just you know treat this as a box and area you can just draw it like this like an area if that makes your life easier same for this one over here right draw it like this to kind of you know better interpret it but again as i've said right my preference is to use a line but if you think a box method would make more sense for you feel free to go ahead next one platinum so in this one i'm going to share with you the eight hour time frame so you can see over here the concept that i've shared earlier resistance right tested once tested twice almost three times fourth time here fifth time then price breaks out if price breaks out of resistance what could possibly happen previous resistance could become support buyers could possibly step in here right to push the price up higher and in this case it did happen one more example or rather uh, second last example this one here is euro against the aussie dollar this is an area of support tested once tested twice came back here consolidate a little breakdown retest previous support becomes resistance head down lower retest this same area of resistance and then continue to grind uh, kind of lower around here 
So again, this is how support resistance looks like on your chart. And again, I didn't draw the full thing. I just wanted to point out the obvious one to share with you the concepts that I've mentioned. But really, if you want to draw another one, I would say this would be another level that you could look at this highs over here. Okay, and one final example, this one here is a uh, Bitcoin. Just to illustrate to you that, you know, hey, the concepts that I'm sharing with you right, can be applied to uh, different markets as well. So if you look at this one over here, can you see this area of support? Okay, tested uh, almost here, almost the first time, second, third, fourth, fifth. Then what happened? Price broke below support. Okay, broke down. Great. So as you know, right, if price breaks below support, what could happen? Previous support could become resistance, which happened over here. Previous support, price breakdown, became resistance. And again, support resistance, they are an area on your chart. So this is why you shouldn't expect the price to reach a particular dollar amount or exact cent right, and reverse from there. No, it's an area. It could exit by a lot. It could exit by a little bit or it could undershoot it. Right, doesn't even touch it and then reverse from there. Okay, so you can see what happened next, right? For Bitcoin, price continues down lower. And then it retests, right? It's going to retest this area of resistance. And watch what happens. It didn't respect this, this area that we had drawn out earlier. In fact, it went deeper, right? To retest almost these highs over here. So you can see I just pulled it back out. Okay, so now. So at this point, right? Support resistance, it's kind of fluid. It's dynamic. You have to make adjustments to it from time to time. So if I were to look at this chart right now, okay? I wouldn't leave my line or my area of resistance here. I might shift it up higher. Right, to take into account right, the recent price move. So this one now would make more sense because it tested this one here once and then twice over here. So let's see what happens next. Then price, I'm going to zoom out a little bit. Price then retest this for a third time over here. And then it finally broke out. So price has broke out of resistance. So as you know, if price breaks out of resistance, what could possibly happen? Previous resistance could become support right previous resistance could now become support buyers could possibly step in could step in and push the price up higher which it did in this case and of course all these charts are cherry pick right just to you know make sure that the teachings the concepts that i'm teaching you right are crystal clear in the real world of trading right there are things there are often things will not go your way and you know you have to be prepared for it Okay, so in this section, right, it's about entry trigger. So let's do a quick recap. What you've learned so far. So, so far, you've learned about market structure. It tells you what to do. Should you be looking for buying opportunities, selling opportunities, or to stay out of the markets? Then we covered about area of value. There are two things we covered in area of value. Uh, support resistance and moving average. And these are tools that you can use, right, to tell you, you know, where to buy or sell. So market structure tells you what to do. Area of value tells you where to buy or sell. And now we're moving to the third component, entry trigger. This tells you when to buy or sell. Okay, so entry trigger, there are many ways, you know, you can use, there are many tools out there to help you time the market. But what I find personally to be very useful is candlestick patterns. And I want to, you know, dive deeper into this section since I find it so useful. So what is candlestick patterns? So candlestick patterns is a method of reading a price chart. Of course, it's not the only way. You have bar chart, you have line chart, you have all the different types of chart out there. So candlestick pattern is just one of the methods to read a price chart and it's, I would say, one of the more popular approaches. So how do you actually read a candlestick pattern? One thing to understand is that there is four data points for every candlestick pattern. You have the opening price, the closing price, and the high and low of the session. So if your candlestick pattern is, let's say, on the one hour time frame, then what you'll see is that the highest price point over the, over the last one hour. And the low is the lowest price point over the past one hour. So a little bit more about candlestick patterns is that you can use it to trade different time frames. So for example, if you see a candlestick pattern on the one hour time frame, it simply means that on the one hour time frame, every one hour, a new candle is formed. If it's on the four hour time frame, every new candle is formed every four hours. And if you're on the daily time frame, one candle is formed every single day. Same for the weekly, monthly, same concept. So now let me explain, you know, uh, how do you actually read a candlestick pattern? So you'll see primarily two types of candlestick pattern. One is green and one is red. But let's talk about the green one first. So remember I said that there are four data points. So how do you actually, you know, uh, know where are the four data points? So very simple. For a green candle, it simply means, right, that the price has closed above, right, the opening price. So let's say this is like a, a one-hour candle. Okay, let's say this is a one-hour candle. So what it tells you that the price, right, has close right higher than where it was one hour ago so that's why it's green right it has closed higher 
you know, compared to where it was at the opening price one hour ago. So that's why it's green. So the opening price will be at the, here. And the closing price will be here. This is the only way for the closing price to be above the opening price. The closing price has to be higher than it. So that's why it's green. It's bullish. So the opening price, once, once again, is over here at this line. And over here is the closing price. We'll add in some numbers later on so you can see how it all makes sense. So what about here? This simply means it's the highest price point over the last one hour, if you're on the one hour time frame. And this is the lowest price the market has win, right? During the past one hour, one hour, right? This is the lowest price point. So this is the high, highest price point over the past one hour and the lowest price point over the past one hour. Of course, if we change this to a different time frame, to the eight hour time frame, the daily, daily time frame, concept is the same. So let's say we try the weekly time frame. Let's ignore the one hour, the weekly time frame. So what does it mean? It, it means that at this price point of the candle, that is the highest price point, right? Over the week, over the past one week. And this is the lowest price point over the past one week over here. And this is the opening price of the week and this is the closing price of the week. So same, same concept. So now what about red candle? So this is just the inverse. So if you recall, this over here was the closing and this is the opening. So the closing price is higher than the opening price. That's why it's bullish, that's why it's green. But for a red candle, it simply means that the closing price is below the opening price. I repeat, right? The closing price is below the opening price for a red bearish candle. So your closing price has to be here. See? And over here is your opening price. That's the only way, right, for this candle to close lower is if the closing price is below the opening price. And likewise, over here is the highs and this is the lows. Exactly the same concept. So if I were to, you know, piece all this together, you will have a chart that looks like this. Okay, this is what I just said earlier. So a little bit more uh, so-called technical definition if you want. So we call this color thing the body. And this, this line over here, we call this the, the upper wick or upper shadow, whichever you, you know, whichever term that you, you prefer. There's no right or wrong over here. And this is what we call the lower wick or lower shadow. Okay, so this is how you read a candlestick pattern. Now, moving on, let's, let, me sh let me share with you how it looks like right, on a real chart and how you interpret it. So I'm going to look at this uh, currency pair. Let's look at the daily time frame. This is Aussie against the Japanese yen. I'm going to zoom in so you can see what. So we are on the same page. So you can see over here, I am going to, I want you to pay attention to these numbers over here, right? This is the opening price. This is the highest price point over the last one day. This is the lowest price point over the past one day. And this is the closing price. And this is the percentage change right in pips. So this number will move, right? Depending where my mouse cursor is. So pay attention. So let's look at the most recent one, this candle here. How do we interpret this? So let's interpret this together one by one. So for this candle, it tells you that this market opened at 83,589. So it opened at this price point, 83,589. The highest price point for the day is 83.788, which is over here, 83.788. The low of the day is 83.036, which is here. The low of the day, 83.036. And the closing price for this, this, uh, this market for this day is 83.529, which is at this price point over here. Does it make sense? So let's do one more example. How about the dollar against the Japanese yen? Okay, now we have a green candle. So same, same thing, right? For this market, the opening price, what does it say? 109.248. This is the opening price, 109.248. Where is the highest price point for the day? 109.96. 109.96. Where is the lowest price point for the day? 109.193. Over here, 109.193. And where is the closing price for the day? 109.614. 109.614. And along the way, you will probably see some candles where they are missing a body. Man, that candle is weird, Rainer. Where's the body? So this is usually when your opening and closing price are too near one another where you get a very, almost a non-existent body candle, like this one here, look at this, right? almost a non-existent body. So yeah, it happens, especially when the opening price and the closing price are very near each other. So if you have a look at this, right? Uh, let me just see what the numbers are so you, you don't freak out. <laughs> so for this candle, the opening price, uh, opening price for this is 103.76 and the closing price is 103.75. Okay, so this is why you can see they are just like a three pipette difference, 0 0.3 pips difference. So that's why their body is almost non-existent. So this is how you actually read a, a Japanese candlestick chart. So moving on, right? So now you know the basics, right? How do you actually, you know, or rather, how do you use it to time your entry? So to do that, right, you want to 
focus right, or learn a few patterns right, to help you do so. And there are two patterns or maybe four patterns that I want to share with you. So first, let's talk about the bullish reversal candlestick pattern and understand you know, what is it, how it works and the story behind it. So the first pattern that I want to share with you is what we call a hammer. So different candlestick patterns, they have different names. They have hammer, harami, engulfing, you know, dark cloud cover and stuff like that. So there's really, really, really a lot out there. But I'm not going to teach you everything because it's not needed, right? As you progress and learn and grow as a trader, you realize that, hey, most of these patterns are pretty much a variation of one another. So I'm going to share with you the most common variations, the most useful ones, and after which you can go on and explore the other, you know, patterns out there. And of course, the basics I've already taught you, so you can just, you know, stack upon what you have learned and to, to learn even more. So first one is what we, I call, or not, I call it, right? people, you know, others out there, the technicians, I right, call it a hammer. So let's understand what hammer is about. So again, where is the opening price? Price open over here. Where is the closing price? For a green candle, the closing price has to be above the opening price. So it's here. Where is the high of the day? Over here. So let's assume that this is a daily candle, right? The high of the day is here and the low of the day is over here. So what's the story of this hammer? So it's quite interesting, right? You can imagine right, that for the, when the market opened over here, the sellers, they were in control, like out of the gate, right? They're like barbarians, you know, running out of the gates and they pushed the market, they pushed the price down near the lows of the day. Then when all the buyers, they're all defeated, right? Then somehow or other, there's like one Thor, one Captain America from the middle of nowhere, shouted, you know, Avengers assemble. And then they all unite and, you know, push the price up all the way up higher, finally closing near the highs of the day. So you can imagine that this kind of tug of war between the buyers and sellers, right? When market opened, sellers came in, you know, smash and, you know, uh, uh, push the price all the way down. Suddenly, sometimes in the middle of the day, the buyers, they woke up, right? They assemble, they unite and they push the market all the way up to close near the highs. Of the day so this tells you that hey you know the buyers are now in control that's why they managed to push the price right push the price all the way near the highs of the day and this is what we call a hammer because it kind of looked like a, a hammer <laughs> okay so another another pattern that's worth uh, learning is what we call a bullish engulfing pattern so the story is very similar but this time around it's expressed right using two candles so for this one over here this is a red bearish candle so you can see that the sellers took control and close the price right near the lows of the day so the buyers were all defeated ah you know injured oh really painful the next day right somehow the, the the buyers they got revived right they grew stronger right maybe they put you know a little bit too much steroids in their body or or whatsoever take some magic potion and they they push the price right to close near the highs of the day once again so they pretty much has overwhelmed right the selling pressure of the previous day how do i know that because you can see that the range of the candle or the range of the body over here was previous previously from this opening price to this closing price but the next day it opened low and closed even higher than the previous day opening price so you can see that the buyers has even overwhelmed right the the sellers right by a little even a little bit more so this is what we call a bullish engulfing pattern so next one the opposite of uh bullish candlestick patterns right this is what we call the bearish reversal candlestick pattern so there are two as well this one is called a shooting star so this is actually the inverse of a hammer I'll just explain the story behind this. So since you know it's a red color candle, opening price is here, closing price is here. So what happened, right? So you can see that when the day started, right? Let's say this is a daily candle. Buyers pushed the price all the way up this higher and mark this highs for the day. And then sell suddenly right, the sellers came in and you know, took control and pushed the price near the lows of the day, finally closing near the lows of the day. Right? So the buyers were, you know, when the market just opened, oh, really excited. Woohoo, you know, let's you know, push the price up higher. Then somehow, middle of the day, you know, things got depressed, you know, maybe, you know, he got reminded of his ex-girlfriend item, this ex-sweater, oh, let me throw this sweater, let me sell, sell, sell everything. And then the market collapsed and sell, sold off and nearly pretty much closed near the lows of the day. So you can see that initially, buyers, they had the upper hand, but they were overwhelmed by the sellers, right, towards the end of the day. So this is where you get a shooting star. So for this bearish engulfing pattern, right, it's pretty much uh same uh, similar story. So we can see for the first candle, it is bullish, right? Buyers were happy. Woohoo, I celebrate, right? They have closed near the highs of the day. But for the second day, right, the sellers took control and pushed the price, right, all the way down lower, exceeding even below the lows of the previous day and the and even the opening price of the previous day. They closed near the lows over here. So we can see that the buyers, once again, they were defeated. Ah, you know, you know, injured, hospitalized, and they'll never, I, won't, I don't want to say <laughs> never to recover because in the market, it always, just, always goes up, goes down. So for now, I would say the sellers has temporarily won the war. Okay, for now. So let me share with you a, a few uh, charts, right? So you know how this looks like on the chart. And you can see that, you know, all the different variations of it out there. So let me point out to you the first one. Let's have a look at, how about? 
dollar against the Japanese yen. So you can see over here, this one looks something like a in between a shooting star and a bearish engulfing pattern. Then uh, we have this one as well, more of a shooting star. If you look at other example like Euro against the USD, you can see over here, this is similar to shooting star, but the difference is the body of the candle is green. So again, when you trade the markets, right, it doesn't mean that it has to be a textbook example, it has to be red, to be red color. Sometimes it can be green as well, but the meaning is pretty much the same because if you look at this, right, this is the price rejection that you have seen, right? The buyers tried to push the price up higher, but got overwhelmed by the sellers and finally closed, right? Near the lows, near the opening, opening price of the day. Over here, you have a bearish engulfing pattern, right? Look at how this range of the candle has, you know, uh, overcome, right? The body of the previous uh, day. And uh, this is a bullish engulfing pattern. Notice how the body of this candle has, you know, uh, is larger, right? And close, right? Even above the highs and the opening price of the previous day. This is a bullish engulfing pattern. And then this is another bearish engulfing pattern. And, and yeah, so later we'll look at some chart examples, uh, you know, in terms of the uh, the market structure, area of value, entry trigger, and stuff like that. But for now, let's do a quick recap. So I know I've covered a lot. So number one, remember market structure, it tells you what to do. Should you be looking for buying opportunities, selling opportunities, or to stay out of the markets? Then we have area of value, which tells you, you know, where to enter a trade, you know, where. And finally, the thing that we just covered, entry trigger, tells you when to enter a trade. And by the way, if you're enjoying this training so far, smash the thumbs up button. If you are not, then hit subscribe and then smash the thumbs up button. Now, moving on, let's look at some real world trading examples and to combine the trading strategies, techniques and concepts that you have learned, right? And see how we can apply it to the real world of trading using real uh, charting examples. So this is the chart of dollar against the South African Rand, as you can see over here on, this is on the daily time frame. So first and foremost, let's ask ourselves, what is the market structure? So when we are trading the markets, this is the first question that we want to ask ourselves. What is the market structure? This would tell us you know, what to do, whether to be a buyer, seller, or to stay out of the markets. So if you look at this market structure, we see a series of lower highs, lower highs, lower high, and lower low, lower low, lower low. So we can see that this market, the market structure is in a downtrend. Second thing, the area of value. Let's put it AOV. Is there an area of value over here? So you know area of value could be things like moving average, support resistance. So from what I'm seeing over here, there is an area of value over here. I can just use it, this tool over here, and to draw this area of resistance over here. I'll just change this to black color. Okay, so now we have an area of value over here. So do we have a valid entry trigger? So remember the candlestick module or section that we just covered? This over here looks like a bearish engulfing pattern. All right, so let's pull it a, a bearish engulfing pattern. So from the looks of it, right, we have a numerous factor, right, working in our favor. Number one, the market structure is in a downtrend. Area of value, the price is at resistance. Our entry trigger, we have a bearish engulfing pattern that's being formed. So in this case, right, we can look for a short trade, right, to short this market in expectation of lower prices. And of course, right, this is clearly a cherry pick chart. And in this case, the price, you know, did win in our favor. Okay, so now moving on, let's look at another trading example, right? Using the market structure, area of value, and candlestick patterns that you've just learned and, you know, use it to help you make a trading decision to, to know whether to buy or sell. So again, let's revisit, right, what we have learned. Number one, ask ourselves, what is the market structure of this currency pair? This currency pair is New Zealand Yen on the 8-hour time frame. So market structure, as you can see, this market structure is in an uptrend, price forming a series of higher highs and higher lows. Here, higher low higher low, higher high, higher high. Okay, what about area of value? Can you see it being near any area of value? So from what I'm seeing over here, the price has retested this area of support, right? Support, support, and support. And also previously, this was actually resistance. So price broke out of this swing high resistance and became support. Now, what about entry trigger? Is there any like signal entry trigger that tells us, hey, it's time to enter a trade? So if you look at this candlestick pattern, right? This over here, what does it look like to you? 
This, right, I would say it's close to a bullish engulfing pattern, but as per the definition of bullish engulfing pattern, this isn't quite one because this uh, green candle didn't cover the body, right, of this red candle. But that isn't going to stop us and say, hey, you know, this is not a bullish signal, it's not time to enter. Because if you read the candlestick pattern, if you read the price section, it's telling you that the buyers, they did, right, close higher for the day. And it did show you signs of strength, right, closing near the highs of the day and almost, right, the previous day opening price. So it closed pretty strongly. So this few reasons right the market structure the area of value and the entry trigger right is uh the story is telling you that hey you can now look for a buying opportunity so what you can do is you can enter on the next day open let's say on this candle here the next day open which is on this candle here okay so now what about stop loss now you know where to enter which is very simple the next day open but stop loss is something that i've not covered and i want to talk about in this uh this example here since it's quite straightforward so when it comes to stop loss right you want to set your stop loss at a level which invalidates your trading setup so what i mean by this so for this particular trading setup that you're trading you're trading is you know in the direction of the trend uptrend and buying near an area of support so this means right if the price breaks below support then it means your so-called hypothesis, right, is wrong, right? Because this is the area of support that you expect the price to hold. If the price breaks below this area of support, and clearly this so-called theory, this hypothesis that you had, that this trade could hit, move higher, is clearly wrong and you want to exit your trade. So to do this, right, it's uh, very simple. What you want to do is to set your stop loss at a level, right, which will so-called break support. So if you look at this, right, clearly, you know, anywhere from, you know, 72, 50 or below, right, at this level, Clearly if, the, clearly, if the price breaks down and hits, hit this level, this area of support is broken and you want to exit your trade. But So is there an objective way you know, to set your stop loss instead of just blindly you know, uh, putting it at some level that looks like you know, far away from support? And the answer is, of course, yes. right. And to do that, you can use an indicator called the average true range. So over here, I've, I've shown you this indicator below, but I'll show you where to get it. Just go to indicator tab, search ATR average true range. It will come out as this one over here. The settings I like to use is 20 period ATR using SMA. So this is just my preference over here. And as you can see right now, the ATR value is about 0 0.322, about 32 pips. So what this tells you is that on this time frame, for New Zealand yen on the eight hour time frame, over the last 20 candles, right, this currency pair moves an average of about 32 pips on average. I'm not saying every single candle, but every single candle, but on average over the last 20 candles or so, this currency pair has moved about 32 pips. So what this means is that you can actually use this value, right, and give it some buffer, right, to set your stop loss below support. So let's say, for example, the lows of support is at this level over here. What you can do is take this level and minus, let's say this level is X, right, and you minus this ATR value, this one ATR value. Okay, so one ATR is equal to 32 pips, right, and let's say you get a value of Y. So let's say Y is somewhere about here. This right can be your stop loss and it's an objective way to set your stop loss based on the volatility of the market since ATR indicator, you know, takes into account the volatility of the market. So let me walk you through how to actually set your stop loss. So what you want to do is to find out what is this low of support. So in this case, right, the low of support, the value is on this candle here and the, the value is about, from what I'm seeing over here, it's $72 and... 72.72 so you just look at this l value which is the low of the candle and you can see it's about 70 72.72 so what i'm going to do is take 72.72 minus 32 pips right 72.72 and i minus 32 pips which is 0 0.32 that is going to give me a value of about 72.4 am i right okay so what i'll do is i will set my stop loss at this level at 72.4 Change this to rate so you can see it better. And your stop loss will be at 72.4. Okay. So as you can see over here, I will show you where is your entry point. Your entry point is on the next day. Open the candle. I'll put it in green so you can see it. Green. Okay. And there you have it, right? So this is this candle here. This candle here, the opening price is where you look to buy. This rate level here is your stop loss. So now let's take things a step further, right? If you have a $10,000 trading account and you want to risk 1% risk on each trade, how many units of New Zealand yen can you buy? Aha, uh -huh. okay, so now what we need to do is to again revisit the concepts that you have learned. So what you'll do is first and foremost, measure the, the, uh, your entry price to your stop loss. So your entry price, let's say, let's uh, make this more precise. Let's say your entry price is at this opening price of this candle, which is about 73.31. Okay, so 
I'm going to change this to 73.31 and your stop loss is 72.4 so you take 72.31 take 72.31 minus 72.4 that gives me a 91 pip stop loss 91 pips okay so what do we do with this information so how, how do I get 73.31 again the entry price on this candle over here the opening price is 73.31 stop loss is 72.4 which is this level here minus 1 ATR and it gives us 72.4 as our stop loss and we take the entry price minus your stop loss right and this is your distance right in pips right for stop loss so in other words from your entry price here all the way down to here is 91 pips so now the question is how many units of New Zealand yen can we buy such that we don't lose more than 1% of our current of our account so time to revisit your position sizing so let's go to this so let's say currency pair is New Zealand yen type in New Zealand yen account currency let's keep it you know as USD let's say your account size is ten thousand dollars risking one percent on each trade your stop loss as mentioned earlier is about 91 pips click calculate it tells you that you can buy 0 0.121 lot which is about 1.2 mini lots okay so if you're going to trade this you know on a, on a I hope it's a demo account right you can buy 0 0.121 lot okay which is about 1.2 mini lot does it make sense so you can see that we have you know used a number of you know concepts that you have learned earlier the market structure area of value entry trigger then we learn how to set our stop loss we learn how to calculate calculate the optimal position size right such that we don't lose more than one percent of our trading account as shown in this position sizing calculator over here okay so how are you feeling do you feel overwhelmed ah there's so much to cover well don't be because you know if this is your first time you know watching this video or you're new to forex trading yes it's perfectly normal to feel overwhelmed and confused but this is nothing you know new this is actually all the topics that we have covered in the earlier part of the video if you're unsure you can you know just go back watch through the videos and to clarify you know on any concepts or techniques right that is unclear to you so i'm going to you know go through another example because this is so important right understanding the the uh position sizing the risk management as well you know how to analyze a chart and you know how to combine all this together and place a trade so that you don't blow up your trading account so let's have a look at another one using the same framework so number one ask ourselves market structure what is the market structure of this currency pair so this is dollar against the japanese yen eight hour time frame market structure is down i'm just kidding it's up right higher highs and higher lows higher highs sorry sorry higher low higher low higher low market structure is up and then you have higher high higher high higher high area of value is the price near an area of value as you can see over here it is at this previous resistance resistance which became support and yes this is an area of value and not just that right we also have if you pull out your 50 period moving average right this 50 period moving average also serves as an area of value we tested once twice three times and then fourth time over here so this is what we mean by when we have like support and the 50 period moving average coming together you know from two separate area of value coming together at a, at a similar area i call this uh stack areas because you have multiple factors coming together to work in your favor so this is a, a stack area you have the area of value of the 50 period moving average as well as previous resistance which, be, which became support the third thing right do you have an entry trigger so from the looks of things when you studied the bullish reversal candlestick patterns earlier this isn't actually any of the uh, candlestick pattern which you have learned but again the memorizing of the candlestick pattern the name is not important what's important is that you can see right buyers stepping in right to push and close higher it breaks and close above the 50 period moving average looking at the range of this candle is pretty nice and large as well and the price is close near the highs so this tells you, you know the buyers are in control right and manage to close right near the highs of this uh, eight hour time frame so what we can do is again uh to me this is a valid trading setup and you can look to buy so let's say you buy on the next day's open opening price of this candle over here so now what about stop loss so again stop loss we want to set it at a level which invalidates our trading setup so our area of value is over here this previous previous resistance which became support okay we want to set our stop loss right a distance below support we don't just want to set it smack below support because like for example this is directly over here because the price will just come down spike through it and then continue higher so you, if you set your stop loss just below it this could happen to you right pretty often and it, it, it sucks so this is why i recommend right 
finding the low of support, right? And then just minusing off one ATR for it. So in this case, one ATR, it tells you it's about 34 pips. So what's left for you to do right now is to find out what's the low of support. The low of support is again, right? Let me look at this candle as the low. It's about 108. Let's make it 109 as shown over here. Right? This is the low. The low of support is about 109. So I'm going to take 109 minus 34 pips. So again, using my trusty calculator, 109 minus 34 pip, it gives me 108.66. So this tells me my stop loss right, should be at 108.66. I'm going to change this to red. I am going to also change the coordinates to 108.66. Okay, this is my stop loss level. Great. So now I want to take things a step further, right? You know how to set your stop loss. You know your entry is at this this price over here. Okay, let me just change this to green about here. Entry price is the this candle open, which is about 109.88. Okay, let me just change this to 109.88. So another thing to to talk about is your target. So so far, so far we have talked about the trading setup, right? Market structure, area of value, entry trigger, to know when exactly to enter a trade. I shared with you how to set a proper stop loss so you don't get stopped out too early. And the final component that I want to add as well is to where to take profits, right? If the market moves in your favor. So coming from, let's say, a swing trading perspective, and bear in mind, there are many ways to take profits. I'm going to share with you one method, which is what we call swing trading, which is in essence, right? Just capturing one swing in the market. So this is like one swing, right? From this retracement, then we pull up one swing. This is one swing. This is uh, another swing. So basically one move in the market. I'm going to share with you how to do that. So to capture one swing in the market, we usually want to set our target profit at before right previous swing highs or low in the market so you know what is swing right this is all swing points swing high swing high swing low swing low so if you are long right you want to exit right before the nearest swing high because this is where potential selling pressure could come in you know and you know push the price lower so you want to set your target before it so in terms of target i would say a reasonable target could be at this price point over here before this remember this over here is an area on your chart not a line so don't set your target, right? Just, you know, one pit below this high. Because remember, it's an area. The price may not get to that high, right? Before it starts to reverse. It could just, you know, come close into that area, doesn't hit the highs, doesn't hit these highs over here, and then it starts to collapse. So if you're too, like, you know, greedy if you take profit, you set it at these highs over here or even over here, you know, it's, you're making it difficult for the market to, you know, give, to give you a profit. So be reasonable with your targets. So my recommendation is to set it before the swing high. So let's say we set it somewhere about here. Right? This I would say is, is reasonable. And let's change this to blue color. Okay, so let's say our target is at, let's put it at a number that is easy to understand. 107 dot, let's say 73, 72, okay? Okay. So now if you look at this right now, you can see that where is your entry price, which is this green line over here. Where is your stop loss? This red line over here. Where's your target, which is this blue line over here. So now again, let's revisit, you know, position sizing since that is so important, right? That is what keeps your account intact. Let's find out, right, the size of our stop loss. So basically from entry price to your stop loss, right? What is this distance over here? So again, just take the entry price minus the stop loss. So what you can do is you can pause this video and do the math with me and see whether you get the answer correct. So I'm going to take 109.88 minus 108.88. Six six, right? So basically, I'm picking this green number minus this red number. It gives me about one hundred and twenty-two pips. Okay, that's the distance of my stop loss. So in essence, from here to here is one hundred and twenty-two pips. So now let's use this number and find out right how many units of dollar against the Japanese yen can we buy such that you know we uh we can you know still adhere to our risk management. So to do that, just go to look for dollar yen. This is the currency pair you're trading. Okay, let's say your account currency is funded in US dollar as well. Account size, let's say now you're a baller, right? 100,000 units you're trading. I mean, your account size is $100,000. And let's say you are still that same, you know, prudent trader. You still risk 1% on that trade. Well done. Stop losses, 122 pips, as we have mentioned earlier. I think it's about 122 if I'm not wrong. Yep, it is. Then you're just going to click, calculate, and it tells you that you can buy now 0 0.899 standard lot. This is equivalent to about 8.9, I would say 9 mini lots, right? If you just round it up, it's about 9 
mini lots or 0.9 standard lot. So in other words, okay, if you have a hundred thousand dollars account and you're risking one percent of that account, let's say one percent is a thousand dollars of your account, and you're trading this currency pair dollar against the Japanese yen, your stop loss is 122 pips. Okay, how many units of this currency can you buy? And according to that uh, risk risk management or rather position sizing calculator you saw earlier, it's about 0.9 standard lot or nine mini lots. It's actually 0.899. I just rounded up to make my life easier. So that's how you you know combine all these different uh, elements together, this concept strategies right to make sense right out of your forex trading uh, career. So let's now take things. Uh, one step even further, okay? So this is actually stuff we've covered earlier. I'm just revising it. So we're going to take things a step further because one thing that you might not notice if you look at this, hey, Rainer, this is my entry price. This is my stop loss. And this is my target. It seems that my stop loss over here, okay, let's call it SL, stop loss, is kind of smaller than my profit target, right? If I just pull it out, let's call it TP, target profit, my stop loss is wider than my target profit. And if you th are thinking along those lines, you are absolutely correct. You can actually use a tool like this over here, okay? Just use the long position one to help you assess right, your risk to reward ratio. So just pull this tool out, right? Just click this one, choose long. And if you're gonna click, let's say you click on this green line, this thing will come out. So the way we're gonna do it is that we're gonna adjust this thing, right? Such that this level here is at our stop loss. Okay. And this one over here is at our target, the blue line. And this over here is smack at our entry point, which is fine. And you can see something very interesting. What it's telling you, how you actually make use of this tool is that see, is that you can see you are risking 122.2 pips, right? Which is your stop loss, 122 pips. And this over here, 84.7 is your target profit, what you have targeted, which is about 84 pips. So in other words, if you look from a risk to reward standpoint, you are risking $1 to potentially make back 69 cents as shown over here 69 cents how do i know it's 69 you can see over here risk to reward ratio 0 0.69 you're risking one dollar to make 69 cents so it's not exactly very favorable and most traders will say uh that's not really a trade that i want to take and i can perfectly understand that so what can you do to make this risk to reward on your trade more attractive so now there are a few things that you can do number one you can of course right shift your target up higher okay to, to a point where you now, okay, you're risking a dollar and make a dollar 37 cents back in return. But as you know, to put your target over here, it's a bit of a, I won't say it's a stretch, right? Since this is a trending market, but what has to happen is that the market, right, has to break above these highs to get to your target. So that's like kind of like a little bit more work, right, for the market to go through to reach your target. And I would say that's a, a lower probability, right, since the market has to break through above this swing high. But again, right, in the context of this price action that we are seeing, I won't say that it's impossible because we are, after all, in an uptrend. But if it's a range market, right, that is, I would say, clearly a very bad uh, decision. So let's say we don't touch the target, right? Let's keep the target the same. Let's say around this level over here. Okay, this is our target, right? So what else can we do to make the risk to reward more favorable? What we can do is, again, we can shift our stop loss. We can make it tighter, right? Shift it up higher. But again, we don't want to mess with our stop loss because our stop loss is at a level where it reaches, right? it will invalidate our trading setup. You don't want to exit your trade while the setup is still valid. It doesn't quite make sense, right? You want to be buying and support and support is not broken, but you already exit your trade. That's that's not very, you know, uh, wise. So the last thing that you can still do is to adjust, right, your entry point. So you know your entry point right now is about 109.88, which is this green line over here. This is your entry point. What you can do is to use a buy limit order Aha, uh -huh, see, this is one of the orders that we have mentioned earlier, to use a buy limit order to enter at a more favorable price. So what if we shift, right, our entry price to somewhere about here at, let's say, 109.5. Okay, so let me just adjust this, just double click this. Let's say our entry price now is at 109.5. Our take profit level, the price, we keep it unchanged. Our stop loss level, we keep it unchanged as well. And we click OK. So now if you look at your risk to reward right now, you can see now you're risking a dollar to potentially make $1.45 as shown over here, $1.45. Now your risk to reward, right? Let me just put it one over here. Your risk to reward, right, has been now improved by using a buy limit order. Of course, 
everything has its pros and cons. So let me share with you the downside to using this method. If you go with a buy limit order, your order might not get filled. And you know, if the market continues higher, you would have, you know, missed the trade. But in this case, right, uh, of course, it's a cherry pick chart. You would have, you know, gotten filled and have entered, you know, at a more favorable price. As you can see, this market did deep down lower and giving you a better entry price and now it's starting to kind of, you know, hit higher. So this is another technique that you can use in your own trading. If at, as of right now, right, if you're looking at your entry stops and target, the risk to reward doesn't quite make sense. You can consider using a buy limit order to get in at a better price. But a few things that I would caution you is to not adjust your original stop loss because that is at a level, right, that is planned, right, to set, right, where if the price reaches it, it will invalidate your trading setup and you want to get out of it. Don't make it too tight because sometimes a slight spike, right, might get you stopped out of your trade if your stop loss is too tight. As for target, this there is some discretion over here. Since, as you've seen, right, this is a trending market, it's not far-fetched to say that, hey, maybe I can move my target up slightly higher somewhere about here. Since it's a trending market, the price tends to break above the previous high. That is fair enough, right? That, I would say it's a fair call. But one thing to, to note that if, if, right, if the market right now is in the range market, right, and you buy, let's say, somewhere about here, and your risk to reward is not very good, don't set your target above the highs of this resistance because you are expecting the price to break above that resistance to give you this target that you have over here just so your risk to reward makes sense and this is really a very bad idea if you're going to you know shift your target to even above resistance but for this context that we are talking about here in this uptrend i would say that is a perfectly you know fair call okay so are you still with me right i hope so and if you are, smash the thumbs up button. But if your mind, your soul is wandering elsewhere, then hit the subscribe button. <laughs> okay, so now let's have a look at another example. This is Aussie against the Swiss franc, as you can see over here. And this is the eight hour time frame as well. So, you know, you should be a pro already by now. You should even know what I'm going to say. First thing first, market structure. What is this market structure? From the looks of things, this market is in an uptrend, higher high and higher low. Higher high, higher high, higher high, higher high, and higher low, higher low, higher low, higher low. So what about area of value? So clearly this one here, you can see that this market is at this area of support. Entry trigger. Do we have any valid entry trigger to enter a trade? Wow, we have this nice bullish engulfing pattern. Okay, so this, this candle has reversed and closed above the previous day closing, or rather the, the highs of the previous day closing now near the highs of this day. So this is bullish, great. So what we can do is that we have a you know, number of factors working in our favor. Uh, market structure is up, trading from an area of value and a valid entry trigger to go long. Let's see, we overlay for 50 MA. Uh, okay, not too bad as well. We even have the 50 period moving average you know, in our favor, tested once, twice, and now here for a third time again. So now, where can we enter a trade? The next day open. So now next day looking pretty good as well. We enter on the next day open. Okay, so what about stop loss? I pull out the ATR indicator. You can see the stop loss, right? The ATR value is about 0 0.003, which is about 30 pips. So again, the, the way to read this stop loss indicator is the same as you're reading a pip, right? You know, a fourth decimal place, same concept over here. So now let's find out what is the low of this support, right? So we can set a proper stop loss level. So the low over here is about 0 0.6818. So 0 0.6818, Minus 30 pip. That gives us about 0 0.6788. Okay, so our stop loss will be at 0 0.6788. Change this to red. 6788. Great. Entry price. Pretty straightforward. We enter on this uh, opening price of this candle, which is about here. I'll change this to green so we can mark as the entry price that we enter. So now, I am not going to go through the position sizing because you should be a pro by now already. As for target, it's going to be quite straightforward. Your target could set it just before this swing high. So let's say somewhere about here. Okay, I'll change this to blue. Okay, and that's a potential uh, level, right, where you can use to set your target profit. So as, you, as of right now, if you just eyeball, you can see that your risk to reward, you're probably risking a dollar to make like 80 cents or so. And as you know, you can use a buy limit order to improve your risk to reward on the trade and you know to manage your risk you can use a position sizing calculator to know how many units of currency you should buy right such that you risk like for example one percent of your account so that is something that we have done through previously as well so one thing to point out is that uh, for this particular example i want to show you how a losing trade looks like in this case the market you know did went in our favor a little bit you can see that it goes up here halfway through to our target over here before it starts to 
reverse and then stop us out for a loss of this trade so this trade clearly is a losing trade it hits our stop loss and only after that right you can see this trade continue to rally and break out higher so this will happen right in your trading career i assure you i guarantee you i confirm plus chop right no matter how good a trading setup looks like no matter how proper stop loss how good of a stop loss that you have set you no know, below the, the the price structure below support the market right sometimes will just you know play tricks on you it will still hit your stop loss right and to make you feel the anguish the pain only to reverse back and you know go so much in your favor right and and to you know and make you feel like a loser so that will happen be prepared for it and this example is really clearly one that illustrated and how do i know that is because this is a it's a trade i took right and it happened to me okay so moving on right let's have a look at a few trading examples and this time around it will be a little bit different it will be trades that i will not want to trade and again we will use the same formula we will use the same uh concepts that we have talked about earlier we have a look at the market structure area of value and the entry trigger so first one aussie against the japanese yen so if you look at this chart on this time frame the daily time frame you can see that the market structure is up great so what will we do we look for buying opportunities second thing where is the area of value so on this chart and on this time frame i see that the area of value is around the 82 dollar price point somewhere here so right now the price is kind of like in the middle of I would say nowhere so it's not near any area of value i'll give it a cross entry trigger is there any valid entry trigger at this point in time well since it's not even at an area of value i wouldn't really care if it's there's an entry trigger or not because i'm not trading from an area of value and right now the price the market is still open it's not closed yet so again uh entry trigger is pretty much i'll say no as well since this market is currently still uh moving and not closed yet so as you can see this is clearly a trade that i don't want to trade yes market structure is it's up it's in an uptrend but it's not from an area of value and there is no you know valid entry trigger for me to pull a trade second one dollar against the norwegian chrono so same same thing let's have a look at this market structure you can see that this one here is in a downtrend series of lower highs and lower lows downtrend area of value is there is it near any area of value so again area of value i would say somewhere around the eight dollar seventy cent price point somewhere here price is over here at this point in time so i would say it's a no entry trigger wise if it's not at an area of value then really usually i don't even bother looking at the entry trigger but for the sake of let's say this training we look at the entry trigger we see there was a shooting stop on a previous day right so there is an entry trigger but because again it's not from an area of value i would choose to skip this trade altogether so hopefully by now you can understand right how market structure area of value and the entry trigger give you a good idea to hey you know whether should i be taking a trade or not okay so at this point i'm sure you know you have learned a ton right we covered the forex trading basics risk management some simple numbers to run through and the final section was actually more of a price action trading right learning about market structure area of value support resistance candlestick patterns and stuff like that and if you're enjoying the training or if you've enjoyed it so far smash the thumbs up button if not then hit the subscribe and, and yeah so for those of you who wants to learn more about price action trading so basically the stuff that we have just covered right the chart analysis the support resistance the candlestick patterns and whatnot if you want to dive deeper into it then i've actually got this book over here that will meet your needs it's called price action trading secrets you can get it on this link over here i'll put this link below and what is price action trading secrets so this is actually a physical color trading book right that will be shipped out to you and in this book right you'll learn more about price action trading you learn how to you know draw support resistance how to tell when support resistance will break we dive deep into candlestick patterns chart analysis how to trade reversals how to trade breakout and much much more so this book over here you can get a copy here today and if you get a copy today today i'll share with you a few bonuses i'll give you a few bonuses for free for free first bonus is a digital edition of price action trading secrets this is actually a pdf version so when you purchase the book today uh, i'll also send you a pdf version so you don't have to wait for your book to arrive right you can start reading immediately the second bonus i'll give you is this position sizing calculator so you can manage your risk and never blow up another trading account so just put in the numbers into this excel spreadsheet and it will tell you right how many units right you should trade whether is it the forex or the stock markets and then i'll also give you this third bonus part-time trading secrets right this is a webinar right that will show you how you can actually trade part-time and become a consistently profitable trader without quitting your full-time job and one special thing as you can see on this page over here i'm giving away three bonuses but for you the one watching right now i'll throw in a special 
unannounced bonus. And the bonus that I'm going to give you, give you the fourth bonus, is actually the slides, right, of my presentation. So all these slides, these slides over here, this one, this entire slides, I will give it to you. So this way, as you're watching this video, and if you want to take notes, at least you have all these PowerPoint slides with you. You don't have to, you know, manually take notes and, you know, to find out what you've learned. All is in the slides. You can have a copy of the slides and it'll help you with your further revision or, you know, or further learning, right, in the days to come. So all this, right, will be given to you for free when you invest in price action trading secrets today. And if you're wondering, right, well, hey, Rainer, what if I don't like price action trading secrets? No worries, because we have a money back guarantee, right? As long as you let us know this, for whatever reason, within the first 60 days that, hey, Rainer, you know, I didn't see any value in this book whatsoever, we'll gladly refund you in full. So just go to this website, priceactiontradingsecrets.com, click on it, right, you'll be brought to this uh, checkout page over here so just go to the page right you see all these blue buttons along the page click on this blue button you'll be brought to this checkout page at the bottom just fill in your name your address so we know where to ship the book to you and this book is like what 1290 for those of you who are living in the united states for those of you outside of the united states it's like 18 dollars 90 cents and that includes the cost of printing of the book and the shipping fee that's it so go to priceactiontradingsecrets.com right get your copy of it with that said i wish you good luck good trading i will talk to you soon